This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Bringing you a little diversity today. First, from Stanford, William Damon. He's a professor of psychology, a guy who knows something about purpose, your life purpose. Second up, number two, George Anders, an author who wrote a book that I really loved years ago called Merchants of Debt. We bring that up a little, but we more importantly go into audacity. Having the you-know-what to go do it. And last but not least, Matthew Walker, the sleep expert. I will guarantee you that you will learn something about sleep that you did not know before this episode. Without any further delay, let's jump right into William Damon, George Anders, and Matthew Walker. My guest today is William Damon. He is a professor of education at the Stanford Graduate School of Education, director of the Stanford Center on Adolescence, and a senior fellow at the Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's one of the world's leading researchers on the development of purpose in life and the author of the widely influential book, The Path to Purpose. Also, and this is really cool, in January 2018, Bill was named one of the 50 most influential psychologists in the world. Quite an honor. And for me, I'm honored that as a political science major with not great grades at all, who has put together some pretty cool investing books, but I feel honored and fortunate that I get to continue to learn every time I do this podcast and I get a chance to talk to brilliant men like William Damon. Think about it. Put yourself in my shoes. I just told you my academic chops. There's nothing to write home about. Absolutely nothing to write home about. I dialed it in. I got through an undergraduate and I got through an MBA. Key phrase, got through. Now, if I can figure out a way to find a purpose, and I got to tell you, this conversation with Bill forces anyone, including myself, absolutely 100%, forces me to rethink about the purpose, to carve that purpose a little cleaner on the edges. It forces that internal inventory, the internal inventory that we should all be doing every damn day. Because look, you can have all the money in the world. And don't get me wrong, I'm a capitalist. I'd like to have all the money in the world, but it's probably not going to happen like that. You can have all the money in the world. You can have all the fame in the world. I guess in one little narrow slice of the world, I have some fame. Amongst older guys that like trading books, why couldn't I get something cool for fame where like women between 25 and 35 are even more interested in me? That's the cool kind of fame, right? The classic Mick Jagger, Robert Plant fame. But I guess I will take my slice at fame right now, because that little slice at fame gives me the chance. And let's bring it back to the most important aspect of what you're about to hear. That brings me back to William Damon and purpose. And if this conversation doesn't force you to think about your purpose on this planet right away, go see a doctor or something. Go get a checkup. Something's wrong with you. I hope you enjoy this conversation with William Damon. You know, Bill, I'm sitting here today preparing for this conversation, and I'm thinking to myself, where was Bill when I was in high school? Where was Bill when I was in college? Why did I not have this purpose perspective? Because as a man in my late 40s, I can look at your world, and I just, you just have those aha moments where there's a, 
a simplicity of what appears to be a common sense idea. There's a lot of data behind it, I know. But what is your purpose? What is our purpose? And my gosh, we just don't think about this, do we? People are beginning to think about it now, but you're right. It's been off the radar screen for too long. When people think about it, they have this, pretty much the same reaction that you do. Uh, that's why, that's part of the reason I think the idea has really caught on a lot. It's kind of amazing. I mean, we've, doing, we've been doing work on it now for about 10 years or so, and everything's changed. Now the word's all over the place, and we get zillions of phone calls and hear stories. There's research being done. I think there was a, a need for the, a need for attention to this idea for sure. Let me take you back in time, though. You mentioned ten years, but your career obviously goes back farther than that. And I'm sure you were probably thinking about these issues early on before maybe it got codified into specific research directions. But start to lay the foundation because this is not just something where you sat back and said, "Hey, I've got a great idea," and then just wrote some books. I mean, there's a lot of research here. And so you've got into the nitty gritty of, of gathering data, the surveying, the, the looking at, uh, at individuals and how they act within families, et cetera. Why don't you speak to perhaps your triggers, your early triggers, even in the field of the developmental psychology? Give me some feel for your start and what fascinated you to go this direction. There were outside influences and there was the direction of my own work. One of the great outside influences was the Viennese psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, who wrote a very powerful book translated into English as Man's Search for Meaning. The uh, original German title was actually Nevertheless Say Yes to Life. Frankl was really the world's first positive psychologist, I think. He wrote in the mid to late-ish 20th century. His great personal story was that he was thrown into a concentration camp during World War II and survived the experience by clinging on to his purpose of writing a manuscript, proposing a whole new approach to psychotherapy that he called logotherapy, which means meaning therapy. His basic idea was we're not determined by our past traumas or whatever our parents did to us when we were young or really any of the experiences that we've had in the past. Rather, we have control over our own fate by looking to the future and by developing purpose, developing something to live for, something to believe in. And he wrote that book, which a lot of people read, but it never had much of an effect on the field of psychology for quite a while, even though a lot of people found it inspiring. At the same time, in my own development, uh, I was doing a lot of work on commitment, commitment of people to their work, for example. We, um, with some collaborators, uh, Howard Gardner and Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, we did a big project called Good Work, which was about how workers in any field, doctors, lawyers, journalists, businessmen and women, uh, educators, teachers, manual laborers, how, how people could become committed to the highest standards of their field, both excellence in terms of really doing a great job and ethics, doing the right thing. What I found, each of us, the three of us, uh, had our own insights about the work, as any three psychologists would. But my take on it was that what all of the good workers had in all of these fields was a really clear sense of the mission of their field, of what the field was about and what the public service was that the field was dedicated to. And the, the mission is not hard to stay. Doctors, of course, are dedicated to healing people. Lawyers are dedicated to getting justice done for their clients. Business people, hopefully, are dedicated to producing services or goods that the world needs. But all of the people that we identified as good workers, really that that mission was front and center, and they were very articulate about how their work served that mission. I thought about this for a while, and I thought mission is an idea that has to do with a field. 
medicine, has the mission of healing people, and so on. But what is the equivalent for individuals, for people living their lives in a psychological sense? And then I got back to thinking about Frankel's work and his, his great book, and I thought, well, this is purpose. Purpose is really the idea that drives individuals towards a good life, towards a successful life, towards a life worth living, a life of meaning, a life that's dedicated to something beyond the day-to-day survival and all of the self-protection and self-promotion that sometimes we get just totally obsessed with. But people that think beyond that, to the future, to the far horizons, to goals that they really throw themselves into, those are the people that are satisfied, that have a fulfilled life. And that concept, that master concept that gets you there, that gets you to understand that, is purpose. So that's how I got onto this. And we've been doing work with people at really all ages. How do you help young people develop purpose? How can schools help promote purpose in students? And then as you get on in life, how can folks at an older age keep their purposes going, get purposes, find new purposes as they retire from their jobs or as their children move on and no longer need day-to-day attention? How can you then fill your life with a new purpose? We and other people have found that folks that have purpose are energetic, they're resilient, they tend to be highly motivated and, as I said, not so not so obsessed with themselves, but rather life and all of life's possibilities. Even gerontology has discovered the importance of purpose. Uh, as I understand it, gerontologists are believing now that purpose deters uh, morbidity and mortality even. People tend to be more vital. Uh, longer in life if they have purpose late in life. It is a fascinating topic because it's a topic, as I said from the very top, we're not having this dialogue on such a wide scale yet. I mean, we can find many books on Amazon, yours, of course, and many others. You mentioned Carol Dweck, and there's a lot of great writing out there, and a lot of people are consuming, and a lot of people are understanding these directions. But if we just blur our eyes and we look at, for example, something silly, it's not really silly, I guess, these days, it's pretty prevalent. The selfie, the use of social media, the short-term thinking, it seems like all of our cultural touchstones today, the things that we use the most, the things that we consume the most, the social media, the news, the media, et cetera, it's all about the moment. And there's, there doesn't seem to be for especially young people, and I know that's one of your focuses, and I want, we want to, we'll start to unpack this, but for younger people today that are being bombarded with social media and apps, et cetera, growing up as a 15-year-old today is quite different than perhaps, of course, a 15-year-old in the 60s, 70s, 80s. I mean, they are facing a a level of information flow, a short-term information flow that's unheard of, unimagined decades ago. Well, I think you're right, and I think we don't really understand yet what the consequences of that are going to be. I can tell you that There still are lots and lots of young people who are very well directed. They do find reasons to dedicate themselves to important things. It's not as if the world has changed so much that it's impossible for a young person to grow up on the right track. But I think you're right. There are a lot of distractions. It could be that at any time in history, there were always distractions. Uh, We don't really know because we can't go back 100 years or 200 years and really look around and interview young people then and see what they were thinking. But for sure, you have a point that's that's important, which is that in today's world, there are lots of short-term distractions and and also inducements to, to worry about the wrong things. A lot of young people worry too much about getting into prestigious colleges, for example. That's something that is a great source of stress for 
a lot of young folks that we see. Bill, isn't that important? I mean, I'm talking to a professor at one of the finest universities in the world, you being at Stanford. Isn't that important, though? Aren't the prestigious universities, if you get in, doesn't that set you up for life, so to speak? <laughs> well, I'm going to say something to, 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 to surprise you, I think. For sure, a good education is important. There's no question about that. And I will say that a Stanford education is a good education, so I'm proud of my own institution. But I will also say that a good education is available at lots and lots of places, uh, including community colleges and state colleges. What's much more important than getting into a prestigious college is getting into a college that's a good match for your interests, for your comfort zone, for the kind of career and vocational interests that you have. And that is not by any means the colleges that rank high on all of the ratings for every young person. I advise young people to not worry so much about status and prestige because we see that the young people who are going to local colleges or community colleges that are working hard and doing a good job end up a lot better than some of the students who are going to the higher rank colleges but don't take it seriously or don't really invest themselves in it or aren't a, aren't a good match for the place. That's just another example of what you were actually talking about, which is people uh, who are getting distracted by the wrong goals. Status, prestige, these are not the kind of goals that are fulfilling in life or that w will give you a good education. See, when you say that, though, when you say status and prestige are not fulfilling and what you're really saying is kind of over the long run. Maybe it feels good in the moment. I mean, if you're 30 years old and you make a million dollars off a of cryptocurrency, you're now pretty much at kind of God level if you didn't have that money. I mean, for your that moment, you're feeling pretty good, and you're and you're near the you're near Silicon Valley. So you've seen many personalities go from zero to sixty. But you're making a longer term case. Why don't you expand on that a little bit? Because you've already talked about kind of like what happens in older age and there's a, there's a physiological element here that you have that purpose. But just having all the money in the bank or being on the magazine cover, that's not, it looks good in the moment, but it's not necessarily going to, it's not going to carry you, is it? Well, there's, I mean, there's even pretty good data on it that the amount of money or amount of celebrity does not produce happiness. Uh, and I'm not, taking a anti-materialistic position totally. I think it's fine for people to have aspirations and ambitions, and certainly you want to earn enough to support yourself and your family. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying nice things in life either. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be a, a prude about this. But I can tell you that if that's all you have uh, is aspirations to acquire more and more and more glitzy things, that is not likely to lead you to long-term authentic happiness. And there are so many cases of this and case studies and observations of people that are just miserable because they haven't found something more fulfilling in life and something beyond themselves. And that's really the main point about purpose is that you need to do something that's dedicated to something larger than yourself in life. Uh, otherwise, you're, otherwise, you will never have enough. You will never have enough to satisfy your materialistic impulses ever. Uh, you'll always be grasping for more and more and more and you'll always come up short. And you'll do a lot of worrying about yourself. And if you're dedicated to something more important, bigger, something that has to do with other people's benefits, your family, your customers, your the world, that gives you something to really be proud of if you accomplish that. Let me take this to an early stage for young people. I can still think back to my high school days. I have certain memories that feel like they were yesterday. Maybe that's not necessarily true how they unfolded, but it feels like that sometimes. But let's talk about high school, because, and you know we can, we can use America as a jumping off point. What I would love for you to kind of elaborate on is the current state of the high school experience from your perspective. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? I mean, to me, it seems like the high school experience, I'm not so sure it's changed since I got out in the 80s, but it seems like it's all about, hey, 
memorize this, and then we're just, we just mentioned, then you will get into XYZ school, and then you will get XYZ job. And they never really tell you what happens after the XYZ job. Maybe there's XYZ family, but the, the purpose part, why don't you speak to the high school experience right now and where we are in terms of bringing young people into the idea of purpose at that age? The first thing I have to say is that you can't overgeneralize because there are a lot of different types of high schools out there. And there is a significant movement, uh, at least in the United States, that has produced a lot of charter schools or charter school networks or kind of semi-independent schools that are available not only to young people with significant means, but now are available to all young people. In other words, they're not charging a lot of tuition and, and things like that. And a lot of these charter school networks, uh, I'll mention just a couple, KIPP and Summit, they're, they're actually doing a, a great job at, at providing a curriculum that has meaning for young people, high standards, and they even uh, are aware of purpose and other character strengths that they pay attention to. There is a movement now that uh, is enlightened uh, at the high school level. Unfortunately, that movement has not transformed the entire landscape of especially public schools. One of the obstacles has been big government policies that have overemphasized standardized tests and the kinds of curricula that have no personal meaning to the students. The students don't even know why they're taking some of the courses uh, other than, and you mentioned this, other than to get the grades in order to get the degree, in order to get into college. But they're not even sure why they are going to college because they haven't, they haven't learned the excitement of being curious and finding out new things and even the importance of the skills for the jobs they want to, uh, they want to get someday because people aren't teaching them this. They're just teaching the curriculum in a very narrow way. And so for a lot of high schools in our, in our country uh, that, uh, that have been, uh, I think, um, dragged into this public agenda of increasing test scores, uh, I think that it's been a, a, a kind of a barren, uh, empty experience for a lot of students who then drift off and become unmotivated and never really learn very much. Uh, but as I say, there's there's reason to hope. There is has been, even in the last three, four, five years, a reaction against the policies that have created the deadly atmosphere in a lot of schools. And there have been a lot of new approaches that that are exciting uh, teachers and I think getting students more motivated. So it's a changing picture. It's a picture that I think there is some fresh thinking and there is reason to hope. But as you said, uh, there's also a lot of reason to regret that a lot of students have been wasting their time uh, during these precious educational years. I want to get into some examples where you can paint a picture for some of those fresh approaches where the audience that perhaps maybe have not yet seen your books can wrap their arms around something different, perhaps than their experience or perhaps than their, their kids went through. I want to go to there in a moment. But first, I'm a curious, something curious I'm thinking about here. You see so many, you've done so much work, you've studied so many people, you've seen so many young people. You see young people with purpose, you see young people without purpose, and there's all shades of gray in there. When you see that young person with purpose, can you always trace back to how that purpose developed? Was it family? Was it friends? Is there always a trigger or is there some element that it looks like there's a, uh, something innate in some kids that they just kind of wake up with the purpose? Or is it always a starting point where there's been a positive influence along the way, something that triggered them? It's more that. Uh, it's more that uh, there are some patterns that most of the young people we've seen who are purposeful have gone through. And they go through it in their own individual way, though. And I think that may be the 
part that uh, maybe that's what you are referring to when you're saying, well, is there something innate? Because no two young people do it in exactly the same way. But there are common patterns. And for example, uh, the young people we see who have found purpose usually have observed somebody in their life, some respected or admired uh, person who is a, a model of purposefulness. And it could be the parent, uh, it could be a teacher, it could be somebody who the young person has worked for in an internship, it could be a media person, somebody who the young person has read about or has seen on television. But there is somebody out there that the young person says, you know, this is the kind of life that I'd like to have. And it's not that the, it's not that the young person will do the same thing. Uh, I'll give you one quick example, um, just because it, stri- it, it strikes in my memory so much because it was so, such an unusual context. Uh, it was a, uh, one of, uh, a, a young high school student who had a summer job working in a fast food restaurant, which is a very improbable place to find purpose. But he had a manager who noticed that this young boy didn't have a great attitude about his job. Uh, And so the manager said, you know, I want you to um, go outside where the customers are and really look at them and, and get a sense of who they are. And the boy did it. And then the manager said, you know, um, these are people who work hard. They come in with their families. This may be the high point of their day. Some of them have really hard lives. And your job is not just to flip hamburgers and put onions on the on the buns. It's to put a smile on those people's faces because they deserve that. That's the kind of that's the kind of uh, life that they've had that they that they really need that break. And that boy said he came away from that job just with a totally changed attitude about working. Now he was not going to go into the fast food business. He wasn't going to be a, a restaurateur, but he applied that message, the idea that you dedicate yourself to your work, you serve other people, you take satisfaction in that, you can really make a difference. You can, what you do matters to other people. And he applied that to his own life. Observing and having a mentor or observing a model of purposefulness is a very powerful inducer of purpose for young people. And then there are a number of other things to the pattern, too. Uh, finding out, for example, what your particular gifts are. And maybe that is partly a little bit of the innate quality you mentioned. If your uh, purpose is to become, let's say, uh, gee, I don't know, a musician or something or a singer, you would not necessarily want to make that into your vocation if you were tone deaf, let's say, uh, if you just didn't have that ability. So you, you need to reflect on what your abilities are, what your interests are, what you get excited about, and what you believe in, what you, what difference you'd like to make in the world, what your contribution could be to make the world a better place. And so all of, when all of these things come together, observing a purposeful model, getting to know yourself, thinking about the world and what the world needs, that's when finally a young person can move forward and commit to a purpose. This can take a long time. Purpose is one of the later developing capacities that we find in youth. Uh, usually by age 20, everything has improved rapidly. But for most of the young people we see, they're just in the beginning of their journey towards purpose at that age. And when we're speaking about young people, support is often critical. I would like for you to go in this direction with parenting is that you can probably have many instances of very caring parents. They want to see their kids do the right thing, but almost every action of the parent doesn't support the child, the young person actually getting closer to purpose. In fact, they could do everything wrong. And I, I saw one example where you, you speak, it's like the idea of a parent, if a parent is going to work every day and the job is just about making money and the parent is coming home and complaining and complaining, you know, that parent might want the best for their child, but the example is not helping the child either. 
that's that's right or, or than complaining for sure, uh, but even not communicating well. Uh, some of the young people we interview, we ask them what their parents do, and they say, oh, well, um, dad types stuff into the computer all day uh, in his office. And we say, well, what does he type in or what does he do? And they don't know what the reason is. Uh, they don't know that he's, you know, somehow causing some food to be delivered to a restaurant or a medicine to be uh, produced or whatever the real purpose of the work is. And so the parent has not even bothered or had the opportunity to talk to the child about why, why, what I'm trying to accomplish in my job, why, why I go to work every day. And the other thing that parents do sometimes uh, that doesn't work out well in the long run is uh, try to write the script of life for the child, to try to actually give the child the purpose that the child is supposed to then dedicate himself or herself to. Uh, you know, the parent that says, well, we come from a family of lawyers. My grandfather was a lawyer. My father was a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. You're going to be a lawyer, too. And that doesn't really work out so well, usually. Kids usually need to find their own purposes. And the parent's role is to discuss it with the child, give the child options, give the child support, the resources the child needs to pursue the child's own dreams. But directly giving the child the direction in life that the child is supposed to take uh, is not is is not usually a successful strategy. Uh, kids need to find their own interests in life if they're going to really commit to them. You know, I'm thinking of a a short video, and I I hope I'm not saying a name that causes you any discomfort. But there's an, uh, the Eastern philosopher Alan Watts. He has this short video that says, uh, "What if money was no object?" And he essentially paints the case exactly what you're saying, which is like, look, find that find that direction, find that purpose that you want. And if you are fully immersed in it, fully embracing it, going that direction, you're going to find the other things you need in life to get through life, for example, like money, et cetera. You'll find if you go that direction that feels best to you and you really embrace it, there's going to be uh, an economic reward there if you go that direction. And, and that's usually true. I think you do have to be I mean, you'd have to inject some realism into it. The young person does need to get some feedback about whether the dream is actually realistic given what the young person is able to do. And I'll just give you an example of that. Is in, in every high school in the United States, there are usually a dozen or maybe more uh, uh, extremely talented kids who would love to go into theater or acting or directing or something like that. If you do the numbers, the, you know, a couple of dozen young people in, in I don't even know how many thousands of high schools, that would swamp the entertainment industry way beyond what uh, it could possibly handle. And, and not all of them are going to have the talent or even the luck or the opportunities to make it. At some point, there needs to be some testing of that dream. And it, it might well be that most of the, those young people are going to have to shift their ambition because it just isn't realistic and, fi and find another dream, find something else that they could do. And if they love theater, maybe they could teach theater or something like that. But uh, I think that uh, not all not all useful dreams are realistic, uh, but I do agree with the idea that what should come first and foremost in your mind is what you believe in doing and and what you really can dedicate yourself to, and then give it a shot, try it out, put yourself into it, but then uh, then see what happens, and you may need to be flexible and shift course a little bit uh, because we don't always uh, um, get exactly what we want uh, in life. Uh, sometimes you do have to make some, you, you have to make some adjustments. I'm curious, Bill, your career, uh, look, uh, very uh, accomplished in where the directions you've gone. Are there any aspects of your career uh, where your peers have pushed back in a way to say, well, gosh, Bill, I don't think that's the right direction. Or have you found throughout your career, it's been more about uncovering 
uh, for all of us, aha moments where the vast majority of people go, gosh, that makes perfect sense. And Bill's done the research and the science is there and it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, uh, when I started doing the work on purpose, it wasn't really on the radar screen of at least rigorous scientific psychology or developmental science. Some people said, you know, you're getting into an area there that's almost spiritual, and this isn't the kind of thing that's ever going to fly with scientific journals. You'll never get funding. You'll never get research grants to support this work. Uh, it's it's just too out there. And that wasn't the first time that had ever happened to me either. How early in life did that happen for you? How did you know your purpose was to keep pushing through those obstacles? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. I would say I, I kind of have to speculate here a little bit because, I mean, who knows really when you're thinking of your own life. But I, I would say that for me, th there were some reasons that I had some confidence that I could do it because I know that I am able to see the big picture. And, I mean, that's one of my gifts, and I'm able to write about things in a compelling way. So I always figured that if I could just, even even if I couldn't get a lot of support to do uh, big research projects, and uh, I, I failed to get grants. I, I always had the sense that it, I, if I could just get a few cases, I could write about it in a compelling way that would convince people. So that was part of it. I had some confidence in my own abilities, but I also know that I'm not very good at doing things that I'm not really interested in. If I uh, went down the other road and just tried to spend my career doing things that people said were safe and were already on the radar screen so that it would be acceptable for people to do it, I kind of knew that that wouldn't work because I, I wouldn't do a very good job of that. I, I would lose interest and I wouldn't be very good at it anyway. So I didn't really have, I, I didn't see it as a choice. I saw, you know, I better give this a shot because it's really the only thing that makes sense. And I think I could do it. So I think it was, it was something like that. And I also believe, just to say one more thing, when people say something like, well, purpose is more of a spiritual thing or it's it's out on the outer edges or the it's a little bit on the frontiers i also believe deeply that that's how science progresses is by taking a chance and doing bringing in something that hasn't really been looked at before because it's seen as being too remote or, or too hard to understand. And if you take a chance at doing that, that's how you really can make progress if you're able to make it work. You mentioned the pushback perhaps early in your career. I'm not asking for names, but was there, was it a motivational? Did it, did that necessarily motivate you with the pushback? That's a really good question. I, and I think, I think you, you're picking up on something in a funny kind of way that, yeah, that um, it does kind of tempt you to kind of go in the face of it. Uh, and that's, that is how I felt a little bit, like sort of, oh, yeah, you know, they say I can't do it. I'll show them or something. It's it, it, There's a little sense of that. Uh, I'm not by nature. It's not necessarily a, rational to pick that direction either. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, you could also make mistakes doing that. And I'm not, you know, by nature a rebellious or contrarian person, but uh, there is a little, I think that that's a natural reaction that a lot of people have. And by the way, I see that in a lot of our young subjects, that when their parents challenge them about their dream or what they want to do, sometimes that little bit of resistance really gets the kid going. And so I think what you're picking up on is not just something about me, but it's a natural human tendency to, up to a point, to get charged up if somebody if you think you're on the right track and somebody is saying no 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 or go slow or don't don't tread in that don't tread there uh it, it's a natural human tendency to say oh yeah i i'm going to really give it a shot now i'm going to really really go for it i didn't plan this but you all of a sudden became a good case study for this subject i have one more question about you though because i think this would be useful for the audience just as one example look it's a small sample size just you but it's still interesting so you go down this path you you kind of have this this direction this feeling that you want to go you're doing your research give me a window of time how long from when you first had the, gosh, Bill, that's not a very wise direction, to where 
you really don't get that anymore. How much time passed? What was that window where you had to display internal endurance to get to where you wanted to go? And you were going to go that direction anyways. It was, I mean, clearly, I can see by the way you're thinking, you weren't, it wasn't like, you know, even if people never came to your side, you were still going to go that direction. But give me a, give me an idea of the time, how long you had to persist. Yeah, I, it, that's a good question, I, and I actually have thought about that. And I, I would say this might sound like a long time, but I would say it's about four years before before people then come around and say, you know, you weren't just wasting your time, or this looks pretty interesting, or something like that. Uh, the skepticism lasted, uh, you know, three four three ish four four ish years before I got some recognition that I was on the right track. And the reason I bring that up is because it could be less time, it could be more time, but generally, if you're going to go down this path of purpose and there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be people that say it's not done that way. And as you mentioned, science is about experimentation and trying new and taking chances. You, you can't expect it to be overnight. That, get, that gets back to the short-term aspects that you have been fighting against. You're, you're right. I think you've, you said it very well. And, you know, as you're speaking, I'm even, I'm even thinking that, you know, it might even be... It might be, even be a sign that you're trying something that ought to be tried if you initially get this kind of blank look from people or this resistance or this advice not to go there uh, or that you'd be wasting your time if you go there. Uh, it, that might even be a good sign because it means you are onto something new. I mean, it doesn't always mean that. And the, sometimes those people might be right. And sometimes failure, you know, sometimes you take a direction and it doesn't work out and failure is part of it. And that's okay too, because you keep going. So it doesn't always work out, but it could well be that skepticism is a sign that maybe you're really onto something that people aren't aware of yet. Let me take it back to the young people uh, perspective and this great forward mantra, you can do it. This is something that, I mean, we're, we're, we're going there in every part of this conversation, but the expressing to the young person, you can do it, you know, that positive affirmation, you can do it. That's huge, isn't it? I think those are the four most powerful and helpful words that a parent can say to a child. You just said those words, and uh, that is a wonderful, great message that parents can give to every child. And it's a true message because every child has something to contribute. Every child has a spark. And when the parents, and the parent is the most admired child, and they, I'm sorry, the parent is the most admired person in the young child's life. And to hear that from the parent, you can do it, is so moving and and helpful to the child. Why are parents scared to say that sometimes? I can't really answer that. I uh, I love that. I love I love the fact that I know your academic career and I love the fact that I'm sitting here right now in Saigon, Vietnam and I can't get an answer. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, sometimes it may just be that the parents aren't even aware that this would be helpful or that they should be saying it. Uh, but I don't I don't know. I don't know, but you know, I would say I'm sympathetic with parents. It's it's not easy being a parent. Uh, parents have a lot of things on their mind. Uh, they have to keep the show going. You know, they have to, um, as we say, uh, bring home the bacon. You know, they have to keep food on the table. They have to keep a roof over the head uh, and take care of the child. And the, and the world is a tough place. They have hard things, sometimes health issues themselves. So parents don't always have the luxury to uh, to have the attention span even to be thinking about every single thing that's the best for the child. They're they're doing the best they can, but uh, they're up against it too. So I'm very sympathetic with parents. And I know that parents, as a rule, most parents really love their children and would do anything for them. So there's, there is work out there. There are people that go down certain paths, academics, uh, other people, and they, they make a case that, hey, this, this particular child had a really rough upbringing, you know, really uh, traumatic things, you know, just parenting terrible, or perhaps there was uh, not enough money, not enough food, not enough everything in the household. That doesn't have to be a lifelong limitation. So for those people, and I see this sometimes in America where we do create, even though it might not be on purpose, we create what I, in my mind, look at as excuses. Now, they might be very, very good excuses, as I just mentioned those things. 
there's something we can look forward to if we can get past where we all start. We all start with something different, but if we can get past, for example, the child, uh, the young person that comes up with a very traumatic upbringing, there, is, there can be something positive on the other side, and it's literally just, is it almost, can it be a, a light switch flip? Can it be an aha moment to get them going in an entirely different direction? I think so, yes. I think, and you're onto something that really I think is the future of, of developmental psychology, actually, which is to turn things around from this old view that people used to have that began with Freud and so on, that we are determined by our early experience. And if we've had traumas, we're always going to have to be struggling and fighting with those, and we will be limited. The view that you've just mentioned is now being called prospective thinking. And it's the idea that we have the power and the ability to shape our own destiny by thinking to the future. And it is a kind of an aha revelation that even some of the difficult things you've been through give you an opportunity to develop strengths that you wouldn't have had if you hadn't had those challenges. Now, that doesn't mean forgetting the past. The past is always with us. It's important for people to own their pasts, and, and there will be some limitations and, that we've developed. But those limitations are not the end of the story. They don't determine our futures. In fact, the only thing that can determine our futures is ourselves, our own aspirations, our own determination, our own belief, our own sense of where to go. And purpose is a, a big part of that. The purposes we find in life and that we construct and that we develop are the road to a fulfilling future. And this was, by the way, this was the message that Frankel had when he was doing the writing. That's why he was such a visionary. And it's very much in keeping with the positive psychology movement, Marty Seligman's work, and the, the best in current thinking in the field, Carol Dweck's work about growth mindset, that we always have the capacity to learn, to grow, and to invent our futures. I have one last, one last question to go into, kind of a big picture question. We could talk probably for hours uh, on this particular word, and I'm kind of going to combine it with the word that we've been using this entire conversation. So if I take purpose and I add moral to it, or we just examine the word moral, it's not a word that is, you know, you don't flip on uh, CNN or Fox or MSNBC and often hear the lead news story with the word moral. It seems like the word that we are running from uh, so much in modern society. Well, let's don't talk about that. That's completely different for everyone. It's just, it's just not talked about. Speak to moral. Speak to, is, is it a moral purpose? Speak to, you know, I think you, you probably have a decent feel for where I'm going. Right. Uh, and, and I think people, um, it, people hesitate to use it because it's, it sounds like too big a word and it sounds almost controversial, like whose values uh, should we call moral. But I would rather think of it in a way that's more common sense, that's more universal. If, if you just think about common decency, about being a decent person, being compassionate, being honest, the basic values that all people need to live a civilized life, to get along with each other, and to become trustworthy, to keep your word. If you think of moral in that way, and, and don't get into big, ideological controversies or thinking of that as morality as being some heroic action that people have to take, but rather just the common decency that's needed to have good relations with the people you love, with your fellow citizens, to obey the laws in your society, and, and to be somebody that people can count on to make a positive pro-social contribution to the world. And I think that is a very important part of purpose, moral in that sense. But, and I would keep it at that level. That, that, if, you, if you think of it like that, if everybody would just behave that way, there would really be much less uh, problems in the world. It's right there at the foundation, as you mentioned at the beginning, like how does one get towards happiness? 
moral as you just defined, uh, talking purpose, this whole conversation, these are all huge keys to finding that happiness, huh? I think so. I think that, um, you know, if you have a life that you're proud of, that you feel comfortable with, that uh, you look forward, you don't you don't have to worry that you're doing something that's harmful to yourself or other people. That's the key. You can build on that all kinds of positive aspirations, and and that that's what we see when. Uh, and and I, I will say the good news is that a lot of people, including young people, are finding ways to do that these days. The rest of us uh, are trying to learn from their examples. So I can highly recommend people to go check you out at Stanford. One of your more popular books, The Path to Purpose. And for those people that really want to dig into the data, perhaps they they think that we were being too general in this conversation, they can quickly go to your your academic stop and and find a lot of data, a lot of white papers. Is there a website we can send people to, Bill? Yes, it's it's very simple. It's the Stanford Center on Adolescence, or Stanford COA. And if you just Google that, it will get you right to our website, and there's a big publications page with all of our work, all of our former students' work, all of our colleagues and collaborators, all of the most up-to-date data on purpose development. It's the Stanford Center on Adolescence, or Stanford COA. That's the website. You know, it's amazing these days that everybody has their niche, their specialty, their direction they've gone. But if you take a moment to kind of and this has happened to me in this conversation with you. If I take a moment to blur my eyes and open up this, this new door, then there's this whole group of people that have dedicated their lives to this direction. I find that, you know, doing this podcast, I find that so much. So it's awesome. I appreciate your work and great insights. Thank you for coming on. Well, thanks for the podcast and for all the good work you do. Now coming up second, George Anders. My guest today is George Anders. He is a New York Times bestselling author. He is your classic journalist. George tackles topics, investigates, uncovers, and gives really interesting, useful stories to all of us without the big partisan slant of today's quote journalist. So I really appreciate that I'm able to have on one of those classic writers. And when I say classic writers, George has been a writer for the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, Bloomberg, over 30 years with some of the biggest publications that we all know. One of the reasons that I really, really, really love George, his classic book, The Merchants of Debt. Now, I won't give away exactly why I like it. I do that in this episode. But it's one of these great books that if you've not read The Merchants of Debt, now it wasn't written yesterday, irrelevant. I mean, if you think you can only read a book because it was written in the year that you're in, you're an idiot. Go buy The Merchants of Debt. Trust me, buy The Merchants of Debt. Go read it now. One of those books that I read in my formative years that absolutely put me on a certain confidence direction. Today, George and I discuss his newest work, You Can Do Anything, The Surprising Power of a Useless Liberal Arts Education. Useless in quotes. Everyone can take something away from this conversation. It doesn't make a difference whether you're an entrepreneur or you're chasing the next job. You're 20, you're 50, you're 70. This is for everyone. It's all about the attitude. And before I jump in today, one quick reminder on the Michael Covell world as we enter 2018. Go to trendfollowing.com. Look at the footer. Five columns, 17 links each column. Those links have been updated like crazy. Content galore. Go dig in. It's free. I guarantee that when it comes to my world, you're going to have the aha moment if you go explore those five columns of 17 links each. Just go on over to trendfollowing.com and you will see them immediately in the footer. 
Now, on to my conversation today with George Anders. I hope you enjoy. I have to go back in time. I feel like, and I don't know if your memory is better than mine, but I feel like at some point in time, I reached out to you in the last 20 years about your classic book, Merchants of Debt. Does this ring a bell? Does my name ring a bell? Or was it just one of the many that did this? So we might have had a Merchants of Debt conversation, but I also remember we had a Turtles conversation. I was very impressed with the, the work you'd done on Richard Dennis's efforts to make really good commodity traders out of nothing but audacity. And it actually became a couple of pages in my book called The Rare Find. And you were very generous with your material and uh, put me on to some of the more interesting people to interviews. We had a lovely couple conversations or email exchanges on that. It just turned out to be. Yeah, I, I knew it was like 10 years ago, but I was I was kind of like racking my brain going, oh, where did the, you know, it's crazy too. You do this podcast. I've talked to like hundreds and hundreds of people, many people that you know, and then everything starts to become a blur. And then I guess we die after that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that having too many memories is like walking down the street with a 40 foot cape and it's dragging against the sidewalk and all of these marvelous <laughs> things that we've done in the past almost make it impossible to move forward. So sometimes you just have to either take off the coat or bundle it up or something, but it's yeah. all good. It's crazy. It's crazy. I have to tell you, you know, to, to, for the audience out there, because we're going to go into a, a different area today, but I want to, I just mentioned it. For me, it was one of those classic reads in the 1990s. I believe it came out in the early 1990s. The Merchants of Debt. What a what a fantastic investigative dig. And I printed out a page here that I love. We probably talked about this years ago. And for me, it was one of those eventful lines that you read in a text, a book. I'm quoting here and it's just, George Roberts never asked to borrow money. He always asked if his bankers could raise a loan for him. And that line has stuck with me for over 20 years. I still quote it, even if I paraphrase it a little bit, because not because I ended up going the direction of the KKR guys, but it was the behind the scenes. Here's how the sausage is made. Here's how an excellent performer, whether you like what he does or not like what he does, here's how an excellent performer behaves. And I'm pulling back the curtain and I'm showing you. And I just think that's so damn cool. You know, the, I don't know for you what your favorite part of it was, but that for me was that line was just fantastic. I share that line a lot when I go and do business school talks because a lot of people are so excited about their model and what they really have to do if they're looking to raise capital is to establish that they're the prosperous one in the room and that it's whether it's a venture capitalist giving them a seed round or a commercial banker giving them a billion dollar facility that knack for projecting confidence and certainty that it's all going to work. And the only question is, are your financiers up to the task? Once you can do that, you've got the money people eating out of your hand and life is good. Yes, it's, it's timeless advice. It worked in the 80s. I see it working in Silicon Valley now in 2017. And I'm sure people will put it to work in the years to come too. Do you think that that is a, I mean, all of these things are learned, but Speak to the intuitive aspect of that or the, the skill aspect. I mean, when you say today, I see that timeless advice work in Silicon Valley, where do those folks learn it? Because some people don't have it. Some of it traces back to family. But, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of the entrepreneurs, some of them come from very successful families. Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, both their dads and moms were quite successful people. And they grew up in a home of success. Some other people, it's just the rage to master. I mean, Elon Musk, who had a much bumpier childhood, but that feeling of, I, I need to be recognized. I want to be understood. Yes, on top of that, you can learn it. You can be around people who project confidence. You can, you know, simple things. I, I did some consulting work for Facebook in 2008. They were far from profitable then. They hadn't really pinned down their business model. They were just growing quite quickly. And I needed to transcribe an interview, and I go down to the supply room to see if they have the $10 pair of earbuds that we all know and love. And they don't. They have $300 Sennheiser headphones. And I'm saying, wait, I'm, I'm just a guy doing a little bit of word work for you. What in the world do I need Sennheiser headphones for? And the guy running the supply room says, please take them. We've ordered 30 of them, and I've still got 20 on the shelves. And it was Facebook's way of saying, if you come into this organization, we are so prosperous. We have such a bright future that we can afford to buy top-of-the-line headphones. And 
you know, the result is you end up with engineers who build a system that's meant to serve billions of people. And now it does. And that's an interesting little story because for quite a few businesses, not Facebook, not Google, not sitting on this cash cow that just repeats daily massive amounts of spinoff, that's probably not the best thing to be doing. If you're the startup and you're on a, sh you know, a shoestring, you probably really don't want to be buying the nicest headphones, you know? It's harder to pull off than it looks. And you're right. You know, after the fact, we know the two or three people who made it work tend to airbrush out of memory the 20 or 30 that went two steps down the road and then the idea didn't work. It's playing for all the marbles. It's the high stakes way of coming at life. But the, the people who can pull it off, it's really impressive to watch. I'm laughing to myself. Here I am. I asked you to appear on the show. And then it sounds like you asked me because my memory is faulty. <laughs> Crazy, crazy. Well, it's it's one of those things you just, it's almost like this kaleidoscope in the sky that I imagine. I see, I see names and I see ideas. And I think for me, one of the things that probably threw me off was the the shift. And I think that's an interesting thing that I would love for you to explore for a moment before we dive into the topic we want to talk about today, which is you. You, I mean, to go from merchants of debt to you can do anything, which has got a certain self-help detail to it, you've covered a lot of different territories. So you've been nomadic in your pursuits. Why? You know, I'm very lucky that I found journalism as a way of making a living for all of us with slightly short attention spans. This is the one place where you get rewarded for moving one, one hot area to the next. And I, I just love learning. I literally have a commitment every day to go to bed knowing something that I didn't know when I woke up. And if that fails to happen, then it was a wasted day. The great thing about whether it's nonfiction books with a heavy reporting component or just traditional newspaper and magazine work is you're always meeting smart people. You're always coming across interesting things. I'm working, you know, four standard deviations from the mean every time. If you're right in the middle, I'm probably not going to be talking to you. But if you've got something exceptional, either on the plus side or occasionally on the minus side, that's the kind of thing that's fascinating to explore. And I've been lucky. I've worked at organizations that have let me move from finance to healthcare, from healthcare to technology, from technology to human interest profiles, and now to a lot of human capital, talent, career type themes. I find that's a great way to blend together a lot of the things that I've seen over the past X years. They all come down to how do I make a strong career? How do I get talent into my organization? Being able to approach those topics panoramically, it just makes for a lot of great opportunities. Let me ask you a question about journalism. So I think for today, 2017, going into 2018, most people's view of journalism are assorted cable TV news outlets yelling at each other. I don't know, or am I asking, I'm, it's not part of our conversation, I don't know about your politics, but I do know you're a journalist. I don't recall anything about the merchants of debt all those years ago that led me to George is trying to push me into a certain political direction. It was, here's what's going on. Now, if I went back and reread it now today, maybe I feel differently. I doubt it. But here's what's going on. Here's behind the scenes. How do you look at journalism today? If we kind of, I see guys like Glenn Greenwald, you know, really going down these rabbit holes. And there's some really interesting people online. But in terms of the big outfits, it seems like journalism that you maybe grew up with has changed. Or am I... Or is what gets featured changed? So it's always possible to find corners of journalism where all we can do is wring our hands and go, oh my goodness, how did that come to pass? But I, I'm going to be the optimist today uh, that we've got tools at our disposal that are like nothing else we've ever had before. I mean, I go back to Health Against Wealth, which is a book I did in the mid-90s. I wanted to track down some court cases. I had to fly to the Denver airport, get a rent-a-car, drive down to the Pueblo courthouse, and sit there and put quarters into a copy machine to get pages of a deposition that was relevant. That's hard work. Now, I can go on to PACER, which is the online court service, and for a lot less money and a lot less time, I can have access to you know, pretty much entire filings across the country. I mean, that just makes you a better reporter. Things happen faster. I was chatting with a colleague who was learning about one of the big airlines and the flight attendants geotag themselves on Instagram when they go into the flight attendant's lounge. And he's a hardworking guy. He's 
on Instagram. He sends a note saying, hey, I'd like to know what's going on at your airline. And the next thing he knows, he's got all of the internal memos. I mean, for investigative reporters, you've never had it so good. It's We're, we're in an age with tremendous information. Yes, you've got the challenge that the old-fashioned print business model has taken a real pounding. But there, there's still ways, whether it's books, whether it's speaking, whether it's consulting, to find a way that you can do the research that you care about, you can get it to the public, and you can make a living. So uh, I'm not one of these people who feels that you know journalism is in tatters. I think some of the you know, 1980 business models are far past their sell-by date. It's a fast-changing world. I, you know, you mentioned Glenn Greenwald and what he's doing with the information and various other organizations, ProPublica is uh, rising up strong, Quartz is doing interesting work. There's a new community of people who are dedicated to getting information out and doing it carefully and not just ending up in these soundbite chowderthons. You know, I was thinking about my Turtle Trader book as you talked about the investigative aspect. And for me, sometimes it's not even the content, it's the how I found the content. I can recall all these crazy freedom of information requests to the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, digging up disclosure documents. And that part, to me, I still feel so excited about the, the puzzle, uncovering the puzzle, finding something that literally no one else on the planet is digging for at that time or digging about it in the context or going down the path that you're going and uncovering it. That's just such a great feeling as a journalist. In many ways, part of my life has been a journalist, even though I don't call myself that. Yeah, in that sense that you got to it first, that a lot of people were looking for it, and there you are. And you find that in other professions. I mean, if you're the doctor who sort of diagnoses a difficult case, if you're the financier trying to come up with a financing tool, if you're the poet trying to create an image, I mean, this is that craving for human creation and discovery and putting up a work that you can say, this is mine. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful field, and there are a lot of wonderful fields that will give people that access. You're kind of getting at your newest title a little bit, you know, which is titled You Can Do Anything, which is one of those great titles. Someone like me, I will just always see that title and go, yes, I must read that. There's going to be something in there for me. I don't necessarily know if everyone thinks that way. They should think that way. But I think the subtitle is really interesting of this particular work, The Surprising Power of Useless, in quotes, liberal arts education, meaning you don't think a liberal arts education is useless at all. But if we were to all only pay attention to mainstream media, you would think that, you know, a bunch of history majors and English lit majors are just, you know, wandering around the fields, uh, you know, writing poetry and having no effect in the economy today. Far from it, huh? Exactly. And in fact, there's a, an irony that some of the most vocal critics, you go back and go, okay, what did you get your degree in? And I think Jeb Bush had come down hard on you know, uh, liberal arts majors. He's got a degree in international relations. You know, The governor of Kentucky is kind of down on drama and dance and other fields. His degree is in East Asian studies. Their very own careers belie that. You, uh, you know, accounting and business are great majors. You know, uh, Computer science is a great major, but you don't have to be incredibly vocational at age 18. You can just stretch your mind, get used to working with a different set of ideas, get to understand how other people think, particularly as you rise in an organization, those turn out to be really valuable skills. You're in the Bay Area. You know, you see so many engineers that are plopped in front of those computers and they're doing fantastic work that's changing the world. And I think if I'm reading your direction. That's one thing. But the honest conversation we don't have is if we tell social people and we tell animated people, extroverts, people that are interested in other subjects other than millions of lines of code. And let's be honest too, many of the guys that are doing millions of lines of code, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, could very well be on the spectrum to some degree. I mean, I remember having on my podcast, Vernon Smith, who has Asperger's syndrome and a Nobel prize. And he talked about Asperger's giving him the ability to lock out everything and be completely in tune with this you know, very dedicated task. I'll relay a story, a very famous hedge fund manager. We were talking about Vernon Smith and he said, oh yeah, I wanna hire guys with Asperger's all the time because they love to look at millions of lines of code. Now on the flip side, how can we expect in the modern age where technology needs to connect to humanity, how can we expect the very people 
that are so immersed in code that they don't pay attention to anything else. How can we expect those people to be the ones that introduce technology to humanity? Exactly. And in fact, I'll, I'll give you a beautiful counterexample. So uh, over the summer, I spent a bunch of time with the people who are building out Alexa for Amazon and all of those echoes that you talk back and talk to, and then she talks back, and the next thing you know, you've picked out your playlist or booked your Uber or found out what the line is at the airport. They have a 20-some person personality team for Alexa. You know, they've got some artificial intelligence at the bottom, but at the top of it, they have to figure out, how is this going to make people feel? Is Alexa trustworthy? Is Alexa sympathetic? And who's running it? It's an anthropology major at the top of it. Uh, they've got English majors. They've got music majors. And there's that sense, exactly as you say, you have to humanize technology. If it's all sort of blinking red lights and robotic Android voices, it frightens us. We don't want to deal with it. And <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that gets regulated and gets shut down. So this ability to humanize, certainly on the production level, but also in the, in the sales, the marketing side, one of the fastest growing jobs these days, uh, and there's LinkedIn data to back this up, uh, is customer success. And what is a customer success specialist? They're the person who goes into the customer that's paid a lot of money for it and isn't using it properly and says, what do you want this to do? Where did we let you down? How can we make this work for you? It's all empathy. It's, it's the same kind of thing that you see in the healthcare professions. I mean, they're, they're mending the health of the business relationship. And people doing that are getting hired by the thousands. And once again, that's your psych majors, your sociology majors, your history majors, because they're used to trying to figure out what's going on in the other person's mind. How do we get consensus here? It's not just lines of code. And it doesn't mean that the liberal arts major, I am one of them, a political science major, it doesn't mean you will not learn aspects of coding, for, for example. You, it does not mean you will not know how a WordPress works or how some of the technology works or the ability to possibly even edit some code. That could very well be part of your world and your career and your direction and what you achieve. How do we get to this point, though, where it seems like the powers that be, and many of the powers that be, are just saying, engineers alone, that's all we need, and the world will be fine, and everybody else is to the trash heap, uh, I don't know, working at McDonald's or working at Starbucks. How did that happen? I, it's bewildering, because if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, uh, the U.S. has created about 10 million jobs in, since 2012. Only about 600,000 of those are in classic information technology, programming, network development, that sort of thing. 94% of the new jobs are coming in non-technical areas. So the, the numbers are screaming at us. I think to some extent, the tech industry has lobbied for more coders because there's a talent bottleneck right now. They're having to pay $200,000 or $300,000 to get great engineers and splatter them with stock options. They'd like to have a bigger pool of people to hire from, so wage pressure comes down. And there's certainly a sense that what you can do coding is exciting. I think the business media has perhaps gone a little overboard in putting one tech hero after another on the cover, and the thinking is everyone is, has got a shot at being the next Zuckerberg. No, that's an opening that happens once a decade. I mean, I, I think of it a lot like pro athletes, that if you do nothing but read about what Steph Curry and LeBron James are up to, pretty soon you're going to tell your 9 or 10-year-old, especially if they're a little taller than average, hey, you should go be an NBA basketball player. We've gone and done the same thing to an awful lot of high school students and convincing them that it's it's all coding. No, that's 6% of the jobs and the new jobs, and it, they pay well. But there's another 94% that you don't have to be a coding genius. In some cases, you can use a little bit of technology, but you can be the user experience expert. You can figure out how to, to make the site look good. You can do the sales. You can do the marketing. You can do the training. There's huge growth in training. You can do the social media. I mean, we've built the, these platforms that need to be filled with content. And whatever else you think of the rise of Twitter, it's been a full employment act for English majors. Because all of a sudden, you know, if you're a company, you need someone who can do something clever playing with words, who can build your brand. You're a political organization. You need people who are up to the minute and snappy and can win an argument in the span of a tweet. Yeah, I think technology creates a lot of jobs for non-technology people. I'm going to quote from your newest work, You Can Do Anything. The central insight is this. The more we automate the routine stuff, the more we create a constant low-level hum of digital connectivity, the more we get tangled up in the vastness and blind spots of big data, the more essential it is to bring human judgment into the junction of our digital lives. Tell me when that changes. 
I see companies one after another actually trying to drive this. I mean, one of the things I did was uh, go research uh, Bill.com, which is a very successful online plumbing supply company. And for their high-end customers, they have phone support. And I said, show me your very best salesperson. And I got one of these classic sales boards that's up, and there's a bell that rings whenever anyone books a $1,000 order. They introduced me to Mary Helen Smith, who's already booked $25,000 of business, and it's just two in the afternoon. And what does she turn out to be? She's an English major from the University of Nevada, Reno. She knows how to work the headset, and she knows how to move the mouse around. But this is stuff you can learn in a month or two. But she has got such a way with people, and she's friendly, and she's caring, and People try and hustle her for discounts, and she asks them, you know, what color sink they want and how it's going to fit in, and tells them that the, you know, the the kitchen's going to look lovely. And then they say, you know what, I don't need a discount. I'll just buy it at List. And she's so much fun to be around that you realize, wow, she is a profit dynamo, and no one's even feeling any pressure from her. And I go, so how does your, you know, English degree get you here? And she goes, I think of everyone as a character in a novel. And if you've read Toni Morrison, if you've read Faulkner, you've encountered the whole spectrum of human hope and depravity and everything in between. And she's just got a great way with people. I don't think you can get that with a business degree. I mean, you, you can know that you don't want to give them the discount, but you can't figure out how to get them into a storytelling mode to close. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's there. It's hidden in plain sight. And somehow we've ended up talking about the tech hiring that's being done at companies when, again, I come back to the numbers. 94% of the new jobs are going for non-tech stuff. And, and somehow we've blinded ourselves to it. Sometimes you just need to write a book about something that's obvious and staring people in the face, but they refuse to see it. I still remember showing up in an MBA program literally the first day. I'm not bragging about what I'm about to say, and I'm not necessarily proud of the look that I had at that day. I was in a t-shirt and ratty jeans with a ponytail and I remember shaking hands with this guy that I met the first time, and he had one of those classic blue blazers on with three gold buttons. And I've always had a thing for the blue blazer with three gold buttons. It just frightens me because it's very robotic. And it's, I think it gets a little bit to your point uh, in a little bit of kind of a funny way, a little bit of your point about the business degrees that sometimes you really don't have that, that intuitive social feel. And to build on that point, I just watched an episode the other day. I think it was fall 2017 episode that I was watching it on iTunes, but Anthony Bourdain visited Seattle on his CNN food show. He was making fun. The entire episode was basically making fun of the Seattle quote tech boys, all of these kinds of nerdy guys walking around with key cards hanging around their neck. And of course, Bourdain, who comes at things from a, from a very, a much more interesting way, you could just see that conflict there where here's Bourdain, this great communicator who can get in and describe situations and connect with just about anybody. And then it's just showing the opposite side of Seattle where you have all of these nerdy guys and it was just, quote, nerdy guys employed by the big tech firms. It was an interesting juxtaposition, to say the least. It, it's quite astonishing. Yeah. You know, my, my rooting interests line up the same way. In fact, when I was uh, doing some work with Facebook in 2008, Zuckerberg was convinced you didn't really need physical salespeople, that you could just use drop down menus and the algorithms would line up everyone's sales. And then somehow they realized that, you know, especially for people who grew up with the yellow pages and, uh, you know, face to face meetings with salespeople and, you know, going to sports events, this just wasn't happening. And people were going, you know, the menu is too complicated. I, I can't buy ads like that. So they started hiring the, you know, sociology majors and the psych majors and everything. And they now are, you know, the best storytellers out there. And I, I sat down with one of them, Best Gount, and I, I shared this in chapter six of the book. She's got the story of a uh, cold snap in New England and people's pipes freeze. They go on Facebook to you know, message their friends of, wow, I can't get any hot, uh, hot water or cold water or anything. And there's an ad for Joe the plumber. The next thing you know, they're, they're calling him. And you use that kind of targeted marketing to get your business. And it's a beautiful story because what it does is connects very much with the small, medium business, you know, independent owner. Don't have to be sophisticated. You don't have to be fancy. It's just the way you can talk to your customers when you need to. And she presents with high energy and it's, you know, you almost start to shiver in the middle because she's described the cold snap so vividly that you, you feel you need a sweater. And you can't do that with drop down menus. So I think the, the opportunities are right there and it's, it's refreshing to see people taking advantage of this. Uh, when I go and talk to college campuses, I'll have students come up to me afterward and say, I feel a lot more optimistic about what I can do with my degree. 
That's not a bad reason to write a book. I mean, we, we've got a lot of glum people right now who are not that far from having really good lives. They just need the confidence to push ahead. And that's my job is to show them the path and give them confidence. You mentioned Zuckerberg, a very interesting individual, obviously, in terms of uh, monetary wealth, one of the most successful people on the planet. I think the, his real brilliance is perhaps understanding his weaknesses in the sense that here he is leading this great social media concern where it's all about people connecting, emotions, back and forth. But if Mark himself was put in charge of trying to sell this concept with the way that he communicates, which is very, I don't say this in any kind of a negative way, but it's very robotic. It's very, it seems very Asperger's-esque. And that's, again, not a criticism. It's just his personality is very much the, quote, tech boy. But it seems like, to me, his brilliance was bringing in other people to help take his great idea and bring bring everybody else along. And so it seems like he he understands his weaknesses and has brought other people in to help humanize. Yes, he has. And in fact, it's interesting during his short time at Harvard before he dropped out, I think he had declared as a computer science major, but he was taking psychology classes as well. And it was, it was a possibility he would have double majored. So there's very much this sense of, wait, you can't solve it all with ones and zeros. You have to start to figure out you know, what makes people tick. And yeah, they've, they've built up a parallel organization. They're really strong in engineering and site management, but they've got a lot of people who can do the humanistic piece too. I think that's how you build a winning company these days. That you, you can't do it entirely on one or the other. You need to, to find the, the way to marry the two of them and, and get strength in both directions. Let me quote you again, something that I love. It's just one of those simple reminders, and this is from your newest work, explore, keep learning, move early and often, make audacity pay off, and piece it together. I don't necessarily know. That's very straightforward advice to me. Looking back over the last 20 years, it makes perfect sense. It's like the golden rules. You should do this. I don't think, though, when people show up at college campuses that's not what the teachers say the first day. Or even if they do, there's still mom and dad in the background of sort of, you know, what's your summer internship? What's your 10-year plan? Most industries, you can't make a 10-year plan. But the only ones you can are the really tight vocational ones, nursing, accounting, the like. So a lot of people get tugged into things that are sort of very structured. And my goodness, there's no better time than your early 20s to experiment. You don't have a mortgage. You don't have kids. You know, barring some catastrophe, you're going to be in the best health you'll ever be in your whole life. And I've, I've talked to psychologists about, okay, how many people are actually capable of doing this kind of movement? And they said about a third of the people have what they call a protean personality, this desire to explore and sort of build your own destiny. And by implication, two thirds of people would rather sit still and be told what to do. To some extent, I'm writing for that one third, but I don't think it has to stop at one third. I think there are a lot of people who could get there. And if they just didn't feel sort of pressured and squeezed into things. And I, I was up at Reed a, a month or two ago doing a, a sit down. Uh, actually, this was Grinnell. And there was a, a student who'd come in, wasn't sure what she wanted to major in, had a very limited set of disciplines that she knew about from her parents. And they put her on to um, human rights law. And she went off to D.C. She did an internship there. And all of a sudden, she began to realize, I could go to law school and not just sort out broad prospectuses. I could actually you know, make a difference. I could get involved in foreign policy. I could you know, uh, travel in Africa or the Caribbean. College should be a time to explore and to discover these different pathways. I mean, otherwise, just go to trade school. And college offers people a chance to do so much more if they just have the, the audacity to take advantage of it. Let me build on that word audacity and another part of your book that at first I wanted to dismiss, but then on second thought, I'm like, hold on, you did exactly this. And that's the notion of alumni. I mean, I'm really one of these people that will sometimes really beat up colleges. And if I, if I got anything out of my Florida State MBA, it was the connection to one alumni. In fact, I remember going to the alumni office. It was, here I am, I want to work on Wall Street. I go to the alumni office, I could literally find nobody, but I, I recognized one name and I thought, did he really go to Florida State? And he was a central character in Michael Lewis's Liar's Poker. His name was Jim Massey. He became the CEO of Solomon Brothers after John Goodfriend. He had just retired 
from Solomon Brothers. And so I literally reached out to him and I said, hey, I'm this guy, Mike, and I'd like to come meet you. I remember taking the train up from Washington, D.C. to Greenwich, Connecticut. I met with him in his office right there at the station. I remember having lunch with him. I still remember what he said. I remember he was zero interested in what I had to say until I said to him in the middle of lunch, I said, hey, have I said anything to you today where you thought I was full of shit? My exact words, because I realized he was never going to talk to me again. I said that to him and he looked at me and he said, yes, you told me you wanted to be the best. No, you just want to win. Now let's go talk. For me, that was one of those great lessons. It was just the audacity of reaching out to someone. That was the very first and look, most people, if they want to work on Wall Street, maybe they talk to their local broker, this or that. The very first person I ever talked to in the financial space was the recently retired CEO of Solomon Brothers. And I didn't have anything in my pocket at all except audacity. I like your style. And I think that, that never goes out of style, that willingness to aim high, to, to go after the person who's three, four, five rungs up. And you don't have to click every time. All you need to do is have one of those moments go good. And the nice thing now is thanks to whether it's Graduate or Switchboard HQ or especially LinkedIn, we've got all these tools where you can go look up the alumni. And if the answer is, you know, who do I know that's working at IBM and machine learning? Boom, you, you punch in IBM, you put in machine learning as your code word, and you know, there are 12 people. You can start to target specific companies. The really underutilized resource are the recent alums, the ones who were, you know, two, three, four, five years out of school because they figured out how to get in the ground floor. And they will show you how to get that first job at the State Department or that first job at you know another high prestige organization. But you've also got the opportunity every now and then to get the, the very senior people. There's something about having gone to the same school. I mean, it's almost like you become part of an extended family where I will make time for people who are current students at schools I've gone to. And I think part of it is I just want to take care of the brand. I mean, if the school falls apart, it doesn't do my resume any good. So I'm kind of <laughs> invested in making sure that, that they keep rolling ahead. And, you know, that, that arrow points in both directions. I think it's just a, a powerful tool. And it's, it's much more democratic now that you don't have to, you know, work at the country clubs where these people are in the summer. All you need to do is be able to write a three-sentence email and follow up with a phone call and good things can happen. I think one of the tricky things today, though, is my little story I just told was pre-email by a couple years. And I think, actually, it was, it was probably right around the, I guess that would have been 1994. So uh, Netscape went public 95. So it was right about that time, though, before everybody was really being inundated. I, I would offer a pearl of wisdom, and I'm sure you will probably have some feedback, too. If, what, if somebody wants to reach out to some of the highest achievers, you got to be clever about it. You can't show up and be looking desperate or begging for something. The best you can hope for is an informational interview where you can, you know, glean something about their thinking or their behavior, or take something away that you can then apply. Again, something you talked about in the beginning of this conversation to gain some confidence. That should be the objective. I think the trick though today for, for people, especially for, since the higher achievers are all well known and, every, and anybody can email them, you got to be a little more interesting about your approach. You, you just can't do a standard issue email. That doesn't mean you show up at their doorstep, but you got to really think it through, huh? It's not, it's not, everyone's connected today and there's only so much time that everybody has to give away. So you really got to think it through, huh? Yeah. And there are you know, a couple basics that, that never change. Be nice to the administrative assistants because they're the gatekeepers. And if they think you're an okay person, things can happen. Same goes for the, you know, entry level recruiters and processors that they're People who, um, who control the hinges on the door and you know, get them on your side. Uh, look for people in professions that are parts of an organization that aren't as outward facing, that may not hear from people that much. I spent some time at uh, one New York area school that's you know not famous for its academic record, but they're a solid school. They get an awful lot of people into compliance jobs on Wall Street, into you know IT services jobs, and. Yeah, you're not the you know showcase investment banker with the apartment in London, but you're working on Wall Street. Anyone who reaches out to someone like that, you know, they're excited. They don't hear from seven alumni a day. And then they also have some understanding of what that person does and some element of personal detail that shows that you actually read up about them. You, um, you know, look to see if they've given any speeches recently, if they've got their content up on YouTube, if they were mentioned in the shareholder letter. And that sense of having done your homework, it, it never goes out of style. If, if you've done that work, I mean, 
anytime I get a note from someone that says I've read Merchants of Debt, they've got 20 minutes of my time. And there's a- <laughs> <laughs> that's, pro- that's probably what I did years ago. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> hey, listen, let's talk about somebody that you bring up in your newest work. I've had him on this show. I find his two books uh, brilliant. Um, that'd be Robert Cialdini, uh, The Notion of Persuasion, Persuasion, his most recent book. Why don't you talk about persuasion? Because I think it goes hand in hand with audacity. You can be, you can have, you can be the most audacious per- person in the world and not be persuasive. I mean, you could just do something crazy and make yourself well known, but that might not persuade. So persuasion opens up a whole different set of uh, skills. And I think you make the good point that liberal arts majors are probably right there at the forefront of learning how, if it's not at least instinctive, learning how to be very persuasive. Yeah, and he's got some very low-key key disarming ways that you can get the persuasion engine working for you. Uh, something as simple as reciprocity. I mean, if you do something nice for someone else, they kind of feel obligated to do something nice for you. And the, the pay it forward sense of favors, you know, helping them out. If, if you've got some you know, research on what students are wanting these days and you send that to someone and say, hey, just wanted to share some campus intelligence with you, that's easier to, to strike up the conversation. You know, other elements of the uh, children any uh, toolkit. Authority, credentialing, being the expert. I have to laugh. I, one of my relatives was off at a doctor's appointment. And I was wondering, you know, does this really need to happen or is this a procedure that makes sense? The guy comes in, he's at a fairly well-known teaching hospital, and he's got someone tagging along with him who's a visiting med student from somewhere else. And the, the visiting guy who never says a word, who's half his age, his jacket says Harvard Medical School. And I go, you know what, <laughs> if, people, if Harvard's flying people across the country to shadow this guy, I don't need to ask him any more questions about his credentials. He must be the number one guy in the field. Mm-hmm. And then I'm a big fan. And it's, it's almost the kind of thing that you, you want to go down to a um, supply store and you know, get a stitching and a, um, device and then just you know, have a Harvard tag along. But I, I share the story because there's a serious point here that if, if you've got a way to establish yourself as an expert, people trust that. People take that seriously. I mean, don't misuse the power. Don't be a fraud. Looking for ways that you can let your your credibility, your experience speak for you. And um, you know, if you're in a seminar, if you're in a interdisciplinary class, you're getting exposed to a lot of ways that, that people move ideas back and forth. And I ended up talking with a, a top technical sales guy, and he said, you know, the class that actually helped me the most in terms of what I do now was a Germany after World War II class because I had to think about what are the French want, what are the Russians up to, you know, why are we have these two different Germanies. He says, I go into a complicated sales meeting. There are five people at the table. They've each got a different agenda. I go, I know how to work this room. You, you can learn a lot of that when you're 20 or 21 in college. And it doesn't have to literally be sales, but it does have to be a situation where you're figuring out how to read the room, how to be persuasive. You know, everyone's not going to do it, and even though I'm going to say everybody should do it, but I can think from my own personal experience, I'm curious your view. Once I became an author, you know, that expertise thing, it, it's a feeling that you can't describe. Not, I'm not, it's not like a, a cocky feeling or, I mean, some people might take it that way, but once you write a book, publish a book, legitimately do it, it really changes the dynamic for how people view you. And I don't think anybody should be scared in their 20s or their 30s getting behind the idea of composing, putting a piece of work together and and making it happen. It is a great business card. I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, It's gonna take you a lot of time and a lot of effort, but it's amazing that that little act of writing a book, if you really, really, really wanna change the game, Boy, it's a game changer, isn't it? It totally is. And we've got the on-ramp now of the ebook. It's not quite the same as a hardcover that's published by, you know, Random House or Little Brown or Simon & Schuster, but you're halfway there. 10,000 words, 20,000 words. uh, It's something you can share at conferences. And then as you master your material on putting it down in hardcover, it also forces you to be clear about what you think. And I think there's something about talking it through. You can get kind of fuzzy with your definitions and kind of hand wavy. When you're writing it one word after another on a screen or on a piece of paper, you actually have to know what you're talking about. Brace yourself for doing multiple revisions and sending it out to friends and getting feedback and 
adding stuff, taking stuff out. But at the end, you'll be a clear thinker on that field. And those are always in short supply. And there's always, there's always demand for what you can do. You know, in putting the title of your book out in the beginning of this conversation, I want to repeat it. You can do anything. The surprising power of a useless liberal arts education, useless in quotes, kind of a, a pun there. But that is a, it's so damn important to realize that we, I mean, we just can go any direction and that any direction doesn't just apply. Because if we're talking about a liberal arts degree, we kind of get fixated on, let's say, early 20s something. But at the mentality, you know, what you've written here, it doesn't stop in my early 20s. I mean, these lessons, these insights are applicable over the course of a life. And I think it's also something worth keeping in mind, and you point this out, the learning process never stops. And it's not like you get out of school at 22 and it's over and you're just going to take a desk job for the rest of your existence. That's not going to be how life is going to unfold. It's going to be a constant, 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 constant until you expire. And that's a good thing. Totally. And in fact, the, one of the last chapters of the book is called Prepared Forever. And I go through some examples of people in in their 30s and 40s who managed to find another hairpin turn in their career that took them to something even better than what they've been doing before. And I open, in fact, with the story of David Risher, who was an English major at Princeton, and he ended up going to work in the classic consulting, MBA, product manager at Microsoft, product manager at Amazon path. So no, he was doing well. He was rising up. He was an important guy in big organizations. But there was this restless side of him that said, I want to do more than just, you know, be one of the people making someone else's dreams come true at a big company. And he ended up taking a year or two off to go teach, and then he moved to Spain. And then he realized what he could do was become a literacy advocate throughout all of Africa and take Amazon's Kindle technology and smartphone technology and be the guy who would get millions of digital books into the hands of people in small African villages and then Indian villages and Central American villages. He's, he runs World Reader now. It's a beautiful nonprofit. He's having the time of his life. He's got the financial modeling skills and the business development skills that he can not just have a dream, but he can actually make it come true. And it's really cool to see. And he's doing exactly what you described. He's willing to say, OK, I don't need to sit at the same desk year after year or wait to move into you know the seventh floor office after having been in the fifth floor office. I can go out and build a new future. And he's done it. If I had to thread our whole conversation together as I build to my last point, my last question I want to go with you, and this is quoting from you. I like the, the two-word phrase, the explorer's spirit, the explorer's spirit. I mean, this is Christopher Columbus getting on the ship and taking off. I know that seems scary, and it seems like you can't control it, but gosh, if you can just let go a little bit and have that explorer's spirit, which builds me too. What I really want to know from you, the most important thing, since I'm only about a six-hour flight from there currently, climbing Mount Fuji. So give me the description. Give me the feeling. Describe for the audience Mount Fuji. I've seen it in the distance, uh, being in the Tokyo area. And it's, it's an amazing, but I've never been there. But now, now you've inspired me just by reading up on your bio. Now I must go. Oh, it's it's unforgettable, and I'll I'll describe everything that's good about it, and I'll give you and everyone listening one simple pointer that will guarantee that you have a better experience than I did, and it'll only take ten seconds of doing something different. So first, let's do the good stuff. So it you know you see it from a distance, and it looks really smooth and conical, and you get up close, and it totally is. I mean, it's as if you took the cinders on a track. And then you just ramp them up at like 25 degrees. It's Japan. Everything's very orderly. You've got a bus that'll take you up to hut number five. And then you do the walk and you get to hut number six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And the early ones, you stop and you get a cold drink. You take in the view. And then pretty soon the vegetation disappears and it's just all of these cinders. And then you get up to the lip of the volcano. And there you are at hut number 10. And you can sleep overnight there. Uh, they'll wake you up at four for the sunrise. And because it's Japan, the time I was there, there were like, you know, 100 tatami mats. And there were only 20 of us. So if this were the USA, we would have spread out. We all would have had lots of room. But it's Japan, so they put us in, you know, slots number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we're sleeping shoulder to shoulder. But that's the way they told us to do it. And then you get up in the morning, and it's incredible. I mean, it's, you know, you're, it's like you're watching God's creation, that you look out, and you now the sky starts to redden up. And 
there you are in this, you know, desolate, beautiful uh, volcano. I did it in the summer, so there wasn't much snow. And then, you know, you can see all the way out to the water. The one thing I messed up on, uh, so they give you uh, a bowl of soup and a raw egg, and you're supposed to crack the egg and um, empty it into the soup, and it's all going to be good, and it'll sort of boil and, and heat up. I'm not too good at cracking eggs even in the middle of the day, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, I just managed to dump my egg all over the table, and I knew the you know, Japanese word for I got it wrong, which is chikai mas. But I, beyond that, I really didn't know where to go with my conversation. Be careful with the egg. You'll have a better experience, but uh, it's a really cool mountain to climb. It takes no technical skill. You just you know, need to be willing to keep going up and going up and going up. For us Americans, and I had this conversation with someone the other day, for us Americans that want to reach for uh, the fork, uh, please get some chopstick skills before you head to Asia. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly versed these days in their use, but don't ask for the fork. They might, if they give it to you, fine, but don't ask for it. <laughs> a, a little progress goes a long way, too. You'll get people praising you for your amazing chopstick skills. And even if they aren't amazing, you're making the effort and they're making the effort, too. And it's all going to be good. Good stuff, George. I appreciate you coming on today. Oh, delighted to do it. Right. Glad to catch up. We can just, just kind of cover all kinds of territory. But it is really one of these works, when you go through it, it's one of those nice reminders you know, where you kind of sometimes you just need somebody who is giving a fresh vantage, even if there are principles and points that you might already know, and I'm speaking in my late 40s, but it's applicable to everybody. I mean, it's these things that you either you don't know or you should know or you forgot. And it's just one of those things where, ah, okay. And you get energized. You know you know this. You, you walk away, even though you wrote it, when you put good information together and it inspires there is a, uh, there's a biological change, you know, it's just like the adrenaline rush, like, ah, I'm ready to tackle 2018. So I appreciate you giving me that, the great piece of uh, 2018 as I approach it, uh, motivation. Fantastic. We're really glad we could do this. Hey, where's the best place that everyone can go to connect with you? www.georgeandersbooks uh, gives you a little bit of information on the book itself. Uh, if you want to order it, that's great. If you want to read some free samples, it's up there too. Follow me on Twitter at uh, George Anders, A-N-D-E-R-S. And if you're on the site, you'll click on how to email me and that'll get you there as well. By the way, you'll like this. I know you are working closely with LinkedIn these days. Somebody just gave me this great recommendation the other day. They said, hey, you need to be on LinkedIn writing long form content. It's one of the best places to be right now, period, go start now. And I will in the new year. George, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Take care. And finally, the sleep expert, Matthew Walker. This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. I'm not in college. I'm not at university. I'm not in grad school. I'm not pursuing my PhD but it sort of feels like I am. But here's the tricky part. I'm not in some niche, right? I get to talk to everyone. It's the coolest damn thing. Now here's a little secret about how I pursue my process. I think everybody I talk to is connected in some way, at least in my maniacal mind. I think it's all connected because it starts with skepticism. You start with skepticism, you go down a path, and you figure out an aha moment. And then you're left with something really cool that's useful for everyone, regardless of their endeavor in life. Oh, you're a trader, you're a trend-following trader, you're a short-term trader, you're an entrepreneur, you're a business person, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer. Hey, guess what? Oh, I forgot one also. You're a student. 
You're just a regular person. You're working at Starbucks. The episode today, I would like to make the argument that all of my episodes are the same in this context, but this episode today, it's for everyone because the topic of the conversation is something that we all have to deal with every day or we die. And what's that? Sleep. My guest today is Matthew Walker, British scientist, professor of neuroscience and psychology at the University of California, Berkeley. His research focuses on the impact of sleep on human health and disease. I got lucky. I randomly caught Matt on Joe Rogan's show, did not know anything about Matt, had not seen his book, dropped him an email, and I quickly realized that Matt is talking to a lot of people right now. He is getting this message out. So I was so happy that I'm kind of a little late to the party, but Matt graciously responded, said, sure, I'll come on the podcast. Once again, I'm a lucky guy to be able to have all these expert minds on. And we are all lucky too, because you know what? Today, I'm giving you the absolute best way you can increase your performance, that's one aspect, and increase all of those things that connect to your human biology, your lifespan, your potential for disease controlling and shaping your own DNA. Yeah, it's all through sleep. And my guest today, Matthew Walker, he's really laid down the gauntlet with all of us. You can listen or you can not listen. And for those of you that don't listen, what's wrong with you? I hope you enjoy my conversation today with Matthew Walker. So Matthew, in preparation for talking to you today, I did one little post on my Facebook. I said, hey, I actually didn't even say I was going to be having initially a conversation with anybody. I just said, look, if you're only getting six hours a night and you think it's enough, it's not enough. A fairly innocuous type statement. You would think most people instinctively know this, right? Oh my gosh, over a hundred comments, got people in there screaming and yelling. You would have thought I had thrown down the gauntlet. One of the things that someone said as I kind of lead into this question, which was really interesting, is they said, well, you know, Tony Robbins has come out. And I love Tony Robbins. I think he's great things to say. You know, he says, Tony comes out, he says, you know, he gets like, you know, five or six or less or something at peak optimization. He works fine at it. It works for him. Now, of course, there's always the outliers and the bell curve and all that kind of fun stuff. But I thought to myself, all of this angst that was existing on my Facebook thread, there was a certain level of machismo, like, you know, I can just, I can just outwill this thing. And it felt very testosterone filled, right? And the funny thing was, is here I have all these guys that are showing their testosterone about how little sleep they need and the <laughs> reality. <laughs> the irony. Why don't you explain that irony? <laughs> yeah, well, we know that men who are sleeping six hours or less a night will actually have a level of testosterone, which is that of someone 10 years their senior, that insufficient sleep that they are so proudly boasting about is actually serving to age them by a decade in terms of that aspect of virility and wellness. So unfortunately, the data is not supportive. And, and I would like to come back to the comment about those outliers, you know, maybe Tony Robinson, you know, people have before quoted to me, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, all short sleepers. The danger there is you're taking a sample of one person and then you're trying to apply it to the masses rather than actually taking tens of thousands of scientific studies and looking at what those studies actually tell you. So I would tend to suggest people follow trend lines and not headlines. And headlines in this case is an individual, trend lines is the science. And by the way, you noted too that people are fighting against this evolutionary mandate of eight hours of sleep a night. And all I would say is that science has taught us anything. Whenever you fight biology, you normally lose. And the way that you know you've lost is through disease and sickness. That was the thing that seemed to be missing on the responses to me is the guys kept coming back about performance. I can kind of just push through to get to the performance. And I kept saying, hey, hold on. 
What about the biological elements going on here? They weren't even considering the aging, the, the potential dementia, the Alzheimer's, the, the high blood pressure, the, the potential heart attacks, uh, cancer risks. They weren't even considering that. It was only I can push through to the performance. Well, I think the phrase push through is critical here. Are you optimal or are you just pushing through? And second, one of the other things that we know is that your subjective sense of how well you're doing when you're not getting sufficient sleep is a miserable predictor of objectively actually how well you are doing when you're not getting enough sleep. In other words, you don't know you're sleep deprived when you're sleep deprived. So I think the analogy would be, you know, a drunk driver at a bar. They've had six shots and they pick up their car keys. They say, look, I'm fine to drive home. And your response is, no, I know that subjectively you think you're fine to drive, but trust me, objectively, you're not. It's the same way with insufficient sleep. And that's why I usually imagine people who say those things truly just don't understand the performance deficit at that stage. Let's start with a big picture. We've talked about numbers for a moment, but I think it'll really help those people that are unfamiliar with your work, unfamiliar with, frankly, the right way to sleep. Let's talk about that optimal number. I think I've seen you say the range is seven to nine. Anything below seven, you can measure the impairment. That's right. Yeah. So we know that once average human beings drop below that seven number, that's when we can actually observe changes both in the brain and the body. But for example, if I were to put an individual on seven hours of sleep for three weeks, at that stage, they would be as impaired in terms of their driving performance as they would be after one night of total sleep deprivation after going without sleep for 36 hours. So it's like compounding interest on a loan. It just aggregates and aggregates. Hold on. You said it's seven hours. It does that. Yeah. We know that one out of every two people in most developed nations is actually trying to survive on six hours of sleep or less during the week. If I take you down to that level, it only takes two weeks to become as cognitively impaired as you would be after pulling an all-nighter. Yeah, the all-nighter thing, I think back to my college days as a professor, you might laugh at this, but never one time, and I wasn't the greatest student, but that's a whole different issue, but never one time did I attempt to pull an all-nighter because instinctively, even though I did not have the knowledge that exists in your work, instinctively, I knew I was useless if I tried to stay up all night. Exactly that. And you can see that in performance. You know, we did a study where we asked, in terms of learning and memory, is it a good idea to pull the all-nighter? So we took two groups of healthy adults. We gave one group a full night of sleep. The other, we sleep deprived. And then we looked at how well they could cram facts into the brain the next day. And firstly, what we found is that when you are sleep deprived, your brain is 40% worse at learning new material. So four zero. To put that in context of an exam, it would be the difference between acing it and failing it miserably. But what we also found, which was quite disturbing, is why the learning change was associated with a change in the brain. And specifically, there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus, which is almost like a, a memory inbox for the brain. That part of your brain was actually shut down when you were sleep deprived. So any new incoming memories were just being bounced. So you couldn't effectively commit new experiences to memory. It is absolutely fascinating, the path that you've gone down. And before I dig even deeper, I want you to paint for me the passion. Now, you're, the, you're my second psych guest from Berkeley. I had Alison Gopnik on, and she was great. Wonderful. She was fantastic. But what has been the driver for you? I want to lay this foundation. You're a very passionate guy. You've obviously gone down this. I mean, as an outsider looking in, I look at this path, and I'm like, you know, it's just so cool to see somebody go down a path that many people are not exploring and, and put something out that, frankly, I don't care where somebody sits on the political spectrum. This is useful information for everyone. And gosh, in such a polarized society, it's nice to have something where we can all perhaps say, oh, my gosh, we can all talk about this. How did you get this passion? How did this start for you? I think for a number of different reasons. Firstly, we know now that I think the global sleep loss epidemic is perhaps one of the greatest public health challenges that we now face in the 21st century. And I don't make that statement flippantly. You know, we've got remarkable health challenges. We've got obesity, diabetes, we've got cancer, Alzheimer's disease. All of those individual disease states are desperately problematic. The issue, however, is that a lack of sleep sits like a superordinate node above all of those things. It's linked to every single disease that is killing us in the developed world, insufficient sleep. 
So by itself, it, I think, consumes more lives relative to any one of those in isolation. That was the first thing. If the second thing was that if you look at this decline of sleep, this great depression of sleep over the last hundred years, it's staggering. You know, Gallup did a poll in 1942, and they demonstrated that the average American adult was sleeping 7.9 hours a night. Now that number is down to only six hours and 31 minutes. In other words, within the space of 80 or 90 years, we have lopped off almost 20 percent of this mandated sleep need. You know, it took Mother Nature 3.6 million years to put this essential thing called eight hours of sleep in place. And we've just done away with, uh, you know, 20%, 25% of that. How could it not come with demonstrable health consequences, which it is? I just felt as though that message has not been adequately communicated to the public. So let me come back to your Twitter feed. You know, a lot of people just didn't understand why proclaiming how they are doing fine on six hours and not worrying about the disease risk. Part of the reason is not just the sleep machismo attitude, which there is, and it's a problem, but it's the fault of people like me. I have not done or had not done a good job of describing the science of sleep, which we have known now for almost 30 years. And I think we are with our lack of sleep where we were with smoking 30 or 40 years ago. We knew all of the science, the carcinogenic, the cardiovascular consequences, but that data had not been out there. So society had not changed its beliefs and attitudes and behavior. It was only when science took 30 years to finally communicate publicly that data, did we make a change and we saved millions of lives. That's what needs to happen with sleep. That was the motivation to write the book. That's been the motivation to become much more of a public figure. I'm a very introverted person. Uh, normally, I'm, I, I don't like being in the spotlight, but I feel so compelled because the disease and suffering that is present in the world right now because of our lack of sleep is so painful. It's not necessary. It is a, it's one of the greatest preventable diseases that nobody is talking about and no one is trying to solve. We're going to have to talk about a lot of different things today that are just eye-opening and perhaps somebody could frame it as uh, negative. I look at your work and I've actually seen you kind of say, hey, you gosh, you know, you've talked to audiences and you say, oh my gosh, I'm going to throw a lot of things at you today that might sound heavy, might not sound so nice. But there's another way to kind of look at this too, that once one absorbs your work, it's like, okay, oh my gosh, if I make certain choices... I get this performance boost that helps me on the performance of what I want to do in my life. It helps me on how long I want to live, how long I want to live. If I'm looking at your work correctly is, you know, from a bell curve perspective is a choice when it comes to sleep, isn't it? It's absolutely a choice for most people. I think there are, for some people, it may not be a choice. And I specifically am talking about people with sleep disorders where that obviously isn't a choice. And also some people from a socioeconomic perspective may just not be given through their work pressures, the ability to sleep. But for the most part, you know, I would say 90 to 95 percent of people who are underslept can do something about that. And you're right about the life span issue. What we know is the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. Short sleep predicts all cause mortality. If you adopt that mindset of this idea, you know, I can sleep when I'm dead. Well, it is mortally unwise advice and you will be both dead sooner and the quality of your now shorter life will be significantly worse. That's what epidemiological studies teach us. Matthew, in the last 10, 15 years, 20 years going back in America, and it's different for other countries, but America's had this huge debate about health care and whether the health care should be private or public. And these debates, I can, I can understand the different positions on different sides of the fences and all that kind of stuff. But what I never hear is I never hear something tangible. I never hear like a, a politician or a leader come out and start to talk about something like sleep. You know, we can sit here, you and I can have this intellectual conversation about this, how important it is. It doesn't make a difference whether somebody is on the right or left. This is just fact. And how we can't get that to a higher level conversation where like literally the leaders of the free world should be giving national speeches about this topic, in my humble opinion. Am I, am I completely nuts? No, if the goal of any head of a nation 
is to try and improve the wealth and the health and the lifespan of the people. Sleep should be one of their top priorities. Absolutely. That's what the data supports. Wealth as well. And I'd love to at some point dive into why less sleep does not equal more productivity. And in fact, sound sleep is sound business. But I'll come back to your question, though, which is a governmental one. I have been lobbying and been very vocal in every opportunity, and I'll take it here as well, to appeal to any first world nation that wants to work with me, because I have not yet seen any first world government that has issued a public health campaign regarding insufficient sleep. And it's puzzling because many of those countries have had wonderful public health movement conversations regarding eating, regarding exercise, regarding you know things like flu vaccination, regarding uh, drink driving, drugs of abuse. Where is the missing piece in that puzzle that is sleep? Sleep is the neglected stepsister in the health conversation of today. And it is not on the priority list of any government. They could make demonstrable changes that would save them as a government huge amounts of money. And I'll give you a fact, you know, the Rand Corporation, an independent survey group, looked at the enormous cost of sleep deprivation in many first world nations. What they found was that a lack of sleep costs most nations about 2% of their GDP. In America, that was $411 billion. Um, In Japan, it was $138 billion. In the United Kingdom, my home country, it was $50 billion. If you solve the sleep loss epidemic within countries, you could almost double the budget for education or you could halve the healthcare deficit in some of these countries. So let's open up some of the contradictions and conflicts with what you describe. If I walk into any airport around this world, one of the primary things they are attempting to sell to me. And look, I'm a guy who's approaching 50. I am a yoga nut. I drink maybe one beer a month if I'm lucky. Okay. So I'm not saying I'm all that. I'm just saying that's what I'm describing. So look, if I walk into that airport though, all I see are racks and racks and racks of brown. And I want to throw an expletive here, but I won't, but I see racks and racks and racks of brown liquor. Right. And so all these people are buying this brown liquor. So even if even if we go out there, we have all these governments say, hey, here's the right way to do it. Then they go to the airport, they buy the bottle of brown liquor, they go home, they guzzle it down. And what happens to their sleep, Professor? Well, alcohol is probably one of the most misunderstood drugs when it comes to sleep. It's commonly used as a sleep aid. Um, Many people turn to alcohol when over-the-counter sleep aids fail for them. Um, They think it helps them fall asleep more quickly. It doesn't. Unfortunately, alcohol is a class of drugs that we call the sedatives, and sedation is not sleep. So all you're doing when you have a nightcap is actually just knocking out your brain, specifically the cortex, which sits on top of the, uh, the brain. So firstly, you're not getting natural sleep when you're drinking alcohol, but then there are two other problems. Firstly, alcohol will fragment your sleep throughout the night, so you wake up many more times. The problem is that they are so brief that they tend not to be remembered. But when you wake up the next morning, you feel lousy, you don't feel refreshed, you don't feel restored, but you never link two and two together because you don't remember waking up so much. If those two things weren't bad enough, unfortunately, this makes me deeply unpopular, by the way. No, not with me. Not with me. I don't drink. so. (laughs) But it's okay. For the most part, um, I'm I'm an unpopular guy anyway, so I guess I'm, I'm already at floor levels. The final problem with alcohol with sleep is that it will actually block your REM sleep or what we call your rapid eye movement sleep, which is essential for a number of brain functions, including creativity, insight, problem solving, as well as emotional and mental health. When you add all of those three things together, alcohol is is a profoundly um, sleep disruptive drug. And um, if you want good sleep, it's to be abstained from. Of course, I don't want to be puritanical. Life in to some degree is to be lived. But all I, uh, I'm here to do is try to describe the science and what we know to be truth and then allow people to make an informed choice with their behaviors. Life is to be lived, but it's going to be a shorter life if they, if everyone goes down some of these paths. It is. And, you know, I think, you know, some of the comments I, I've sometimes had from um, media that I've done, people will say, well, yes, but if I'm sleeping just six hours a, a night versus eight hours, I'm awake for two hours every day. Maybe I'll die at 60, but if I get two hours extra every day, 
then I'm still probably going to have just as much life as I would do if I slept eight hours. Firstly, the problem with that is those years that you have lived are going to be more unhealthy. So you're going to have a shorter lifespan, but more importantly, you're going to have a shorter health span. The other thing is that, yes, you may be awake for longer, but you're also going to be largely in a stupor <laughs> because you're so sleep deprived. So I don't think it's the type of quality, you know, it'd be like watching a YouTube that is, you know, on 144 DPI. Why would you do that when you could watch it at 1080 high resolution? That's what a full eight hours of sleep actually you is. You know, I saw you on a national uh, TV broadcast, a morning show, and it seemed to me uh, some of the questions and one of the, the hosts was asking, he was older and he was asking some questions. And it, I just felt, so, he felt so obligatory, like meaning, okay, we got the sleep guy here. Let's ask him some questions and move on to the next segment. I mean, there was just the, I guess I, I see your point where some people don't like what you're having to say, because I guess I've, I've witnessed it in my own, my own preparation for this conversation. So it's, it's really amazing that people aren't more open-minded because it's fascinating that once people go, to, like yourself, researchers go down this path, figure all this out. You know, smart people should say, oh, my gosh, this is great. Let's adopt this. One of the potential problems here is that people become so used to feeling as though they are OK with six hours that they can't believe that they need more. But what's remarkable, you know, I get this a lot on social media. People say, OK, I finally I heard Matt speak and I, I decided to try the experiment. I tried getting, you know, eight hours of sleep opportunity every night. And my goodness, I never realized I could feel this way. So I think that's the first thing, this misbelief that eight hours will actually give you something more than you're currently feeling because you've reset your baseline into this kind of dull state of non-optimality. And you don't realize that you can be so much more. A lot of people say, well, this is just me at age 50. If you get eight hours at age 50, you may actually start feeling 40. But I think the other problem, though, in terms of the pushback is that sleep has an image problem that in society in this day and age, we equate getting sufficient sleep with this concept of laziness, that if you're getting eight hours of sleep, then you're slothful. It's surprising to me for at least two reasons. Firstly, human beings are the only species that will deliberately deprive themselves of sleep for no apparent good reason. And second, even we human beings don't always hold that attitude of sleep being useless because no one looks at an, a baby sleeping during the day and says, well, psh, what a lazy baby. And we don't because we know that sleep at that time of life is non-negotiable. It's absolutely essential. But if you look at the data somewhere now between infancy and even childhood, we abandon the notion that sleep is important and necessary and to be celebrated and embraced. And we chastise it and we stigmatize it with this label of laziness. And I think that that's a huge problem. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that I face. So Matthew, in the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years, uh, all the rage has been uh, the, uh, the legalization of marijuana across uh, various states. And, and I have smoked marijuana. When I was younger, I tried whatever, you know, I uh, just didn't like the feeling of smoke in my body, whether it's a cigarette or marijuana or whatever, but look, plenty of people do. And back to the alcohol point, what's marijuana doing to sleep? I mean, if everybody right now thinks it's wonderful that there's all these publicly traded companies and we could all make all this money buying marijuana, but everyone's stoned, <laughs> what's happening to all those folks that think there's no ramifications to getting high on their sleep? Marijuana does actually speed up the time it takes you to fall asleep. It's called your sleep onset latency, which just means how long does it take you to fall asleep? And people seem to fall asleep in a shorter amount of time. The problem, however, with marijuana is that like alcohol, but through a different mechanism, it also seems to block rapid eye movement sleep or dream sleep too. One of the problems there comes back to mental health issues. We and others have done studies where you will selectively deprive individuals of this thing called rapid eye movement sleep, which is otherwise known as dream sleep. And if you do that night after night, just selectively depriving them of rapid eye movement sleep, so they still sleep maybe seven, seven and a half hours, but you've just prevented them from getting any dream sleep because as soon as they go into dream sleep, we go into the room in the sleep center, we wake them up, and then they fall back asleep, we wake them up again. 
after about three or four days of that, people start to have hallucinations and delusions. And essentially, they start to show signs of going into psychosis. They become psychotic, um, believing things that aren't true. They have paranoia, um, seeing things which are not there. You could imagine that if there is something like alcohol or marijuana that is routinely and chronically depriving your brain of REM sleep, it may heighten your risk for aspects of psychosis and mental health disorders. So I think it's one of those unspoken about dangers when it comes to uh, to those drugs. Now, we also don't know if some of the other variants of marijuana, looking at CBD oil, for example, some people use that, which doesn't necessarily have the euphoric sort of feelings that come along with classic marijuana. We don't know what those things like CBD oil actually do to sleep and whether or not they are less disruptive. So could you still get some of the the speeding up of the time that it takes you to fall asleep, but without the the detrimental blocking of REM sleep. We don't know. That's unclear right now. But people should be aware of that. Let me keep down the path of a couple more of these big picture issues that affect our sleep that we all really don't think about so much. And I think now, especially in the last 10 years, the age of the iPhone and I, this one I'm guilty of. I am so guilty of this one, which is going to bed and feeling like I'm relaxing by sitting there at night and, you know, checking something online on my phone or whatnot. Speak to me about what your research, all your hard work has taught us about this device usage at night, having too much light at night. And, you know, I've had a lot of people come back to me and they want to talk about the blue light issue. Frame, frame some of these topics together so that people can understand what you have learned. So there are at least three ways that those gadgets will disrupt your sleep. The first is using them before sleep. For example, a studies done were if you read on an iPad for one hour before bed relative to just reading a book in dim light, the iPad will actually block the release of a critical sleep uh, timing hormone called melatonin. And you need melatonin to rise in the evening to help tell your brain when it is time to fall asleep. And when it's at a high concentration, that's when your brain is instructed to get sleep, sort of time the onset of sleep. Well, if you're using those blue light devices, your brain is fooled into thinking it's still daytime. And so it puts the brakes on that hormone called melatonin and melatonin is not released. And therefore, you're not going to feel sleepy. And in fact, it will delay the rise of that melatonin by up to three hours. So in other words, if I'm here in California in Berkeley, and I read for an hour on my iPad, my peak melatonin, which should normally be present for me probably around about 10 o'clock in the evening, that's not going to arrive until 1 a.m. In other words, I'm now on Hawaii time. It puts me there in terms of a time zone. So that's the first problem with these devices, the blue light. Um, it's actually light of all kinds, by the way. Um, blue light is especially damaging, but even just um, normal indoor lighting, I think the recommendation to people would be try turning down half of the lights in your house in the last hour before you uh, go to bed. You may be surprised at how um, sleep enhancing and how tired and good your sleep becomes when you do that and certainly doing away with the gadgets. The two other ways that these devices become problematic with sleep, the first is what we call sleep procrastination. It is a thing, which means that you get into bed, you've got your phone by your side uh, or your iPad, and you, you're sleepy. You could fall asleep just fine, but you think, oh, I should maybe just check email one last time. I should just paste, uh, post on, on Twitter one last time, or I'll check Facebook, or I'll do Amazon, or those things quickly add up and all of a sudden you look at the clock and now it's 30 minutes later and you've just lost half an hour of sleep. That sleep procrastination becomes a problem. The final thing is what we call um, anticipatory anxiety. Many people listening probably have had that feeling where if you've got a really early morning flight that is absolutely critical. Let's say it's for a job interview and you've got to make that flight. You know for a fact that you're not going to sleep well the night before this. You may fall asleep and stay asleep, but the depth of your sleep is just not as deep. I hate this. It drives me crazy. This is the one I'm most guilty of. <laughs> it, it, it's an awful thing. But what happens when you leave your phone there, even if you're good and you put it into airplane mode, just that fact, because most people, when the first thing, if you look at the data, the first thing that most people do when they wake up in the morning 
they swipe, they unlock, and then this world of anxiety comes flooding in. Emails, uh, text messages, tweets, all of these things which ramp up the fight or flight branch of your nervous system, which is what causes anxiety and stress. Just knowing that that's what you have to look forward to each and every morning is a low-grade form of that early morning flight that is absolutely essential. And the studies have demonstrated that the depth of your sleep is not as deep when you're anticipating that anxiety the next morning. So those are the three ways that technology has been uh, a problem uh, in terms of the bedroom. You know, I'm switching back to the biology part here. I had a guest on this show years back named Sharon Moalem, and the subtitle of his book was How Our Genes Change Our Lives and How Our Lives Change Our Genes. Professor, the floor is yours to explain to people on a very, very micro level what's going on when we have this lack of sleep to our genes, our DNA. That's perhaps some of the most frightening data that we've seen come out recently, which is that if increasing your risk for developing things like cancer or Alzheimer's disease were not sufficiently disquieting enough, we have since discovered that a lack of sleep will even erode the very fabric of biological life itself, which is your DNA genetic code. And in one study, they actually took a group of otherwise completely healthy adults, and they limited them to one week of six hours of sleep. And then they measured the change in their gene activity profile relative to those very same subjects when they were getting eight hours of sleep. And there were two, two critical findings. The first was that a sizable and significant 711 genes were changed in their activity caused by that insufficient sleep, which is relevant, by the way, not just in terms of its number, but also because of the sleep manipulation. We're not talking about total sleep deprivation here. A lot of people are trying to survive on six hours of sleep or less during the week. So this is a very, what I would say is ecologically relevant. In other words, it's relevant to most people's lives in terms of an experimental change. The second result perhaps was even more important. About half of those genes were actually suppressed in their activity. The other half were actually amplified in their activity. Those genes that were suppressed were genes that were related to numerous aspects of your immune system. So in other words, you start to become immune deficient at a genetic level by way of six hours of sleep for one week. Those genes that were actually amplified or over-exaggerated in terms of their expression were genes that were related to the promotion of tumors genes that were associated with long-term chronic inflammation within the body, and genes that were associated with stress, and as a result, cardiovascular disease. I think, you know, the take-home message for me from those types of findings is, is that many people in, in the public feel uncomfortable about the idea of, let's say, you know, genetically modified food, or even genetically modified embryos, but by choosing to get insufficient sleep, we now must all accept that we are performing a similar genetic modifying experiment on ourselves. And if we don't let our children get the sleep that they need, we are inflicting a similar genetic engineering experiment on them as well. You mentioned we are choosing, and that was something that happened in my Facebook thread, is several people said, well, you know, they kind of were saying, I'm not choosing this. I just can't get it. They weren't even allowing themselves to step back and say, hold on, let's do an inventory here. What is my routine and what's an optimal routine? And let's see if I can make some changes to get to the optimal routine. They weren't even considering that. It was just, I can't sleep well. Yeah. And for some people, they may actually be you know, very good in terms of the dedication to an eight hour sleep opportunity every night. But they may be suffering from, you know, probably the second most common sleep disorder, which is, or probably actually it's probably the first most common, the most common, which is insomnia. There are two forms of insomnia, one that we call sleep onset insomnia. The other is called sleep maintenance insomnia. They're not mutually exclusive. In other words, you find it difficult to fall asleep or you find it difficult to stay asleep. And those are hugely problematic. We know that the prevalence rates are somewhere between 12 to 15 percent. One out of every 10 people that you walk past on the street has clinical grade insomnia. And actually, it's very difficult to get a diagnosis because the, the bar, the threshold 
clinically to have a diagnosis of insomnia is very, very difficult. If you scale that back and relax the threshold a little bit, what we know is that one out of every two people, every two adults in most societies report struggling with their sleep at least once a week. Testament to that is the fact that here in America, in the last month, 10 million people will have swallowed some kind of sleep aid, which is to me, just the, one of the most profound demonstrations of how desperate people are for sleep. Another way to phrase this is that, you know, it took George Lucas with the Star Wars franchise, I think about 40 years to amass about $4 billion in profit in revenue uh, generation. Well, it took Ambien less than two years to generate that same $4 billion in profit. It's also blocking in other ways, not unlike alcohol and marijuana too, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the other conversation to have. And it was probably one of the most debated with my publishers um, chapters in the book. In the book, there is an entire chapter on sleeping pills and, and whether you should or should not take them. And I make some quite significant claims, but it's all backed up in the science uh, and the legal team released it. It was it was solid. What we firstly know is that sleeping pills like alcohol are also sedatives. They're called sedative hypnotics. And again, sedation is not the same as sleep. But we also know that the depth of the deep sleep that you get when you're on those drugs isn't the same. So you don't feel as refreshed. You can often feel groggy the next day. Perhaps what was more concerning and what caused the problems in or concerns with the book was that there is now very good evidence that sleeping pills are associated with a significantly higher risk of death as well as cancer. And it is considerably higher. You know, there was one study that looked at 20,000 controls versus 10,000 people taking um, sleeping pills. What they found was that if you are taking sleeping pills, you're about three to four times more likely to die across a two and a half year period than those people who are not taking sleeping pills. It doesn't take much. Even just five pills to something like 30 pills a year still increased your death risk by almost 200%. I don't know if I've ever had a conversation with someone, and I've seen some of your work already. It's the biggest PSA ever. I mean, it's like just amazing information. Look, I know you're not the only guy involved in the research, but you're, you're a big leader right now. And it's just amazing. I mean, this should cause people to shake. Like, how did I not know this? Why are we not talking about this? Why do all my family members and friends not know about this? Everyone should know about this. Yeah. And I think, you know, that was what was heartwarming in reading a lot of the comments um, on the reviews of the book on um, websites like Amazon, et cetera was how eye-opening it was for people and how they became in essentially, you know, sleep ambassadors themselves. They were just so struck and they would say, you know, I just can't stop telling everyone about this critical necessity of sleep. I'm buying the book for people and sending them all of this information. Because when you understand, you know, how essential it is, sleep is mother nature's best effort yet at immortality. It is the greatest healthcare system that you could ever wish for. And it is, for the most part, democratically available to everyone. And that's just, that's why I continue to fight for this thing called sleep. And I am, I am so keen to reunite humanity with the sleep that it is so bereft of. Because, you know, I don't want people to suffer. And I also know just economically, it makes a huge amount of sense. And I could give you one very easy, simple example. We know that if you are getting just five hours of sleep a night in the week before you get your flu shot, you will only produce about 50% of the normal antibody response, rendering that flu vaccination largely useless. And we know, for example, in America, that the flu costs the economy about $10 billion directly. It's about $100 billion um, indirectly, all told. You know, if we could simply just get, by way of maybe sleep trackers and intelligent software, people sleeping sufficiently in the week before they get their flu shot, we could dramatically alter deaths as well as morbidity associated with every single flu season. And it would germinate productivity in the workplace because you're not losing those days of sickness. Let me give you a 
kind of fun one in the middle of, of this conversation. So years ago, in my mid-20s, I was going down this path of having conversations and talking with masters of the universe traders, traders on Wall Street. And I remember I went to this one guy's office in Stanford, Connecticut. His name was Mark. So if he's listening, hopefully he will laugh. I won't say his last name. But he's a, he was a big guy. He's like six foot five. We sat down, we had this nice conversation. He was so cool, you know, gave me all these insights as a guy kind of coming along that really didn't know how any of this stuff worked. And he told me in the middle of our conversation that he had a process for working on new problems and learning. And he would take this, whatever he was working on with him, and he would lay down at night uh, to go to bed. He'd be thinking about it. And he put a little piece of paper and a pencil next to his bed and he would work on it while he slept, and then he would wake up in the morning and he'd write down notes or something. And I remember thinking as like a 25, 26-year-old guy, I remember thinking, okay, I don't know how this all works. Okay, this guy's really, really smart. He's really successful, but this sounds really freaking nuts. This doesn't, <laughs> this doesn't <laughs> sound normal. And I remember thinking like, okay, I, I just, I don't know how to really, uh, I don't know where to put this one. But, you know, now I'm going through your work and I'm kind of like, you know what? I think I know where to put this. <laughs> yeah. And there's a reason that you've never been told to stay awake on a problem. And we know from good scientific data that sleep can actually produce about a threefold increase in creativity and problem solving. These, these studies have been well performed. We've done a lot of these studies, too, on sleep and creativity. Uh, and there's lots of wonderful anecdotes to support that too. You know, musical anecdotes, we know that um, McCartney had some great compositions, you know, Let It Be came to him in a dream. We know that Keith Richards would go to sleep with a cassette recorder and his guitar in his bed and probably a lot of other things in his bed at the time as well. But let's set that aside for a second. Because he, he knew that sleep could at some point just grip him with creative insight. And in fact, he reports in his autobiography that the opening chords to Satisfaction, the most famous Rolling Stones song, actually came to him in terms of dream-inspired insight. He said that, you know, every night he would press record and then he would go to sleep. And the next morning he woke up and he rewound the tape. He played it back and he said, there in some ghostly image were the opening chords of Satisfaction that I played in the middle of the night followed by about 43 minutes of snoring. But it did come to him, gifted by way of sleep. This idea that what sleep, and specifically it seems to be dream sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, dream sleep is a form of informational alchemy. It's during dream sleep that the brain takes all of the recently learned information and then starts to collide it and intersect it with all of your back catalog of information. So you start to test out new associations, you start to seek new connections, and you wake up with a revised mind-wide web that is capable of divining incredible ideas and solutions to previously impenetrable problems. Let me take you to something else that happened in my thread. And I had one guy that was trying to make the case that younger people literally don't need to sleep. And you have done some work and you've put some studies together, perhaps other research too that you've brought in and aggregated. The school start time, that one is one of those aha moments that should cause parents to just go, oh my God, OMG, as they might say in Saigon, Vietnam, Troy, oy, it's one of those ones. And, and talk about the school start time and connect it with some of the research on the SATs. So I think in, you know, 10 or 15 years time, we will look back and we will be desperately ashamed about the earliness of school start times because the data is fast accumulating. And I think it is now unequivocal. One of the earliest studies that looked at this happened uh, in America, in Minnesota, and they shifted their school start times from 725 to 830 in the morning. Um, and the first thing to note, by the way, about that is, you know, what are we doing trying to educate our next generation at 7.25 in the morning? That's, it's clearly not a good idea because for a 7.25 start, school buses will begin leaving at 5.30 in the morning, which means that some kids are having to wake up at 5.15 or 5 o'clock or even earlier, which to me is utter lunacy. But to get back to the, the study, they looked at the SAT scores 
in the year before they made the time change, when kids were going to school at 7.25 in the morning, the average SAT score of the top performers was 1,288, which it turns out is a very respectable score. The following year, when they were going to school at 8.30 in the morning, the average SAT score was 1,500, which is a 212 point increase. In other words, that will dramatically change which tier of university those kids go to, and as a consequence, their ultimate life trajectory. I think people have questioned some aspects of that early study, perhaps for good reason. But in all of the subsequent studies that we've done, the data now I think is very clear. Academic grades increase, behavioral problems decrease, truancy rates also decrease. And then we also see psychiatric and psychological problems. They too also decrease dramatically. It's just one of these things where you, when you start to wrap your mind around how many of these different variables that we are in control over, that we mess up on, and how it affects our lives. I mean, look, here's another one, daylight savings time. I, I currently am in a culture, uh, a country that doesn't operate with it, so the time changes. But if I'm in this country uh, on a, on a, for a year, then six months of the year, I'm plus 11 hours East Coast US, and six months of the year, I'm plus 12. Daylight savings time, it, pretty much from what I can tell from your work, is not a good thing. It can be a killer, unfortunately. Well, and I think the daylight savings time is one of is probably the largest global sleep experiment that happens. It's performed essentially on 1.6 billion people across about 70 countries twice a year, of course. And what you find if you look at the data is in the spring, when we lose an hour of sleep, there is a subsequent 24 percent increase in heart attacks. But in the autumn, in the fall, when we gain an hour of sleep, there's a 21% reduction in heart attacks as a result. So I think that that's how, you know, that's how vulnerable our bodies are to even just one hour of lost sleep across one single night, let alone several hours of lost sleep across weeks, months, if not years. As we wind down here, Matthew, I want to bring it back to something we talked about at the very beginning. We were talking about testosterone. We were talking about men. And you brought up the, the numbers talking about what happens in terms of your testosterone production going down. But I've seen you make the case in public, too. It's also a, a size issue. Literally, there is a, <laughs> test, a testicle size issue going on with a lack of sleep. Why don't you really get uh, very graphic there so my male friends out there can perhaps even wrap their arms around this even more? Yeah, not only is a lack of sleep going to sort of be emasculating at the level of testosterone, but um, men who sleep five to six hours a night do have significantly smaller testicles than those who sleep uh, eight hours or more. We also know that they have more deformities in terms of their sperm. And it's not just men, by the way. It's also we see equivalent impairments in female reproductive health caused by insufficient sleep. And that's why, you know, from a from a very non-humor perspective if you have a young couple that's trying to conceive but they're both not getting sufficient sleep uh, that's a very difficult challenge because of these demonstrable changes in the reproductive system caused by a lack of sleep hey one last thing too this is really i think a really important one for people to consider statistics is a very difficult subject for people and when i posted this uh, comment somebody came back and they said well you know look at this guy david wells he was a pitcher for the yankees he was very overweight and he would go out and party every night and he pitched a perfect game like and he said on like three or four hours sleep or something and so this person comes onto my you know facebook and says well look at david wells look at this example and i think people really need to grasp the idea of a bell curve and not just go hunting and you've already said this in this podcast not just go hunting for that extreme outlier because if everyone imagines themselves being the outlier then it's just illogical. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Outliers, you know, are usually used for confirmation bias to support your own, you know, predilection. And that's always dangerous. You should always just be open to the data. You know, and I think with with sleep, one of the one of the other issues uh, to keep in mind, too, is that um, the number of people who can. Well, actually, let me say it this way. 
a lack of sleep is going to get you one way or another, and it can get you acutely or it can get you chronically. One way that lack of sleep will pop you out the gene pool and end your life very quickly is drowsy driving. We know that um, insufficient sleep causes more car accidents than either drugs or alcohol combined. And we know that is far more deathly as well as a consequence. The reason is because when you have what's called a micro sleep behind the wheel, where you just kind of the brain essentially just falls into a sleep state for just a second or two. At that point, you tend to make no reaction at all to an accident potential event. Whereas when you're drunk or you're intoxicated, you're just making an action that is too late, but you're still making an action. That's why insufficient sleep is much more deathly from a road traffic accident perspective. So firstly, you know, if you're bragging about, you know, maybe outliers or, um, you know, people may be able to get away with it for one day in terms of driving, but it can get you acutely in that way. The other thing though is chronically, that's how a lack of sleep will ultimately impact most people. And a good example here is hypertension. You know, a lot of people don't know that they have high blood pressure and they can be doing the wrong things for year after year after year. And they say, well, look, I'm I'm smoking and I drink and, you know, I, I kind of eat lousy food. But look at me. I'm, I'm strong as an ox. and I'm still standing here in front of you. But then 10 years later, they suffer a massive coronary or they die of a brain hemorrhage because of a stroke due to that hypertension. It's the same way with sleep. You don't know you're not getting sufficient sleep when you're not getting sufficient sleep. You're not aware of it, um, but it will get you, unfortunately. The elastic band of sleep deprivation will stretch only so far before it snaps. I got to share with you really quick, really fun little story I did when I was like 20 years old. I was driving from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. It's about a 20-hour drive. I didn't know anything about how sleep would affect my body or whatnot. So I figured, okay, I'll try to sleep during the day and I'll start driving at 11 o'clock at night. I'll take a bunch of Vibran, you know, I thought, okay, I can just drive all the way through the night to get to New Orleans. I got to about three or four o'clock in the morning and I was passed out of my car on the side of the road. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, that, and that, that's the right thing to do. You know, it's, it's just not worth it. You know, either you could lose your own life or you could take someone else's life. The book, Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams. Matthew, where is the best place beyond Amazon where people should go buy this book? This is, this is one of those books that you should I actually just bought three copies for my family and just sent it to them. <laughs> where where okay. should people go to check you out? Where's the best place beyond a Google search? They can find you everywhere. But is there a website? I do. I have a website and I'm on social media and it's all Sleep Diplomat. So uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at Sleep Diplomat. Um, I'm on the web. Uh, sleepdiplomat.com, uh, the same thing in terms of LinkedIn. So people will find me there, unfortunately, or fortunately. You've sure picked a topic that I think most rational people, I, well, hold on, most rational people, I'm not sure calling humans rational is smart, but for most rational people out there, this is one of those topics that's pretty universal. So, hey, listen, I appreciate the work and best of luck and uh, can't wait to see all the new things you figure out in the, the years to come. Thank you so much and a privilege to be on the show, Mike. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.